the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are truly grateful for your grace. Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar. May you extend your divine wisdom to our lecturers so that they would be able to effectively impart their God-given knowledge to all of us. Give them blessings as they continue to bring their expertise to people who need them. Bless the participants as well so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this activity. May you bestow your blessings after this seminar so that we may be go out, spread what we learn, and serve the people who are in need in the spirit of your love and generosity. May we realize that this activity should glorify your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit.
My dear colleagues and partners in the medical profession, it gives me a warm welcome for everyone present in the interest of the Mindanao chapter of the Philippine Urological Association. I'm pleased to be part of this fulfilling event to participate virtually, which is indeed a sign of the times. COVID-19 has generated a whole new set of scientific and clinical difficulties for us to address. It's provided us with fresh research frontiers to explore. At the same time, it is compelling us to reconsider a great deal more. This year, the theme of our third postgraduate course is Multidisciplinary Outlook in Urology. As I have said, this is the third of the series of virtual postgraduate course organized by the Philippine Urological Association, Mindanao Chapter. And this is a follow-up of the previous, which was entitled, Moving Forward and Rising Above the Pandemic. The pandemic, indeed, is reshaping the way we think, and if we are wise, the way we will act upon the painful but valuable lessons that COVID-19 is teaching us. However, while SARS-CoV-2 has captured our attention and occupied our minds for the past two years, all of the other scientific challenges from the pre-COVID-19 era remain very much alive. These are the difficulties that inspired us to pursue professions in science and medicine. Much like COVID-19 inspires the next generation of researchers and physicians to put their shoulder to the wheel and respond to the call of duty. These are the challenges that continue to motivate us every day. Now through this course, we will be able to identify the areas in our practices that may need improvements, as well as gain further information on the different aspects of our profession. We have invited distinguished speakers in the different specialties to share with us their knowledge and expertise on each of their respective disciplines. To them, I offer my heartfelt thanks. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Nimrod Firaza. For the past two years, he masterfully crafted this course to our benefit. My hats off to you, Nim. And to our sponsor, ECE Marketing, who are always with us in our all in all our endeavors. Your support is and has always been appreciated. Thank you very much. I ensure that this course will be profitable and the next few hours will be enjoyable and fruitful for every one of you. Once again, thank you very much and I hope to see you all in person in our next postgraduate course gathering. Magandang umaga. President of PUA Mindanao Chapter, Dr. Ricardo F. Halipa Jr. and its Executive Council members, Dr. Paul Nimrod B. Ferraza, postgrad course director, fellow urologists and frontliners, our friends from our sponsor, ECE Pharmaceutical Incorporated, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed an honor and privilege to welcome you all to the third online postgraduate course of the PUA Mindanao chapter entitled Urology Practice Hacks 3.0, a multidisciplinary outlook in urology. 
in the field of urology, it is crucial that the whole team would be one in, with its goal for better health care delivery. As the good book would say, no one lives for himself alone. We are naturally interdependent. PUA Mindanao Chapter has been very successful in coming up with Urology Hack post-grad series. They never run out of innovations and are always generous in sharing their efficient ways on going around the conventional practice dealing with urological cases. In this post-grad, we will be updated on the new takes on pre, intra, and post-op patient care. The highlights of the hacks of urologic practice includes different takes of ob nephrology, pediatrics, family medicine, and even urology nurses on patient care and management will be greatly discussed. The psychological impacts of pandemics to all healthcare workers and a lot more will be included in their scientific program. Welcome everyone to the third online postgraduate course and again congratulations to the leadership of the PUA Mindanao chapter president Dr. Ricardo F. Halipa Jr. and the whole PUA Mindanao chapter for coming up with an educational meeting. I hope that we will have an informative and productive convention ahead of us. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. God bless us and God bless PUA.
Dr. Niccolo Buenaventura, DPBU, a graduate of the East Avenue Medical Center, Urology Program. Hello everyone. I am Dr. Niccolo Buenaventura, a urologist. My topic for today would be catheters, okay, draining with care. So my topic outline would be your catheter basics, anatomy, uh, your catheter pearls, catheter associated UTI, when you need to diagnose and refer, and other common uro urologic procedures. So let's go to your catheter basics. So let's proceed to your catheter. Okay, so this would be your basic standard uh, urinary catheter, which is a two-part catheter. And this would be your 16 French catheter. So what, is, what does uh, French mean? So one French means 0.33 millimeter in diameter, or one millimeter is equal to your three French. Okay, so this would be your drainage port. Okay, then this would be your balloon port, which is co color coded, and uh, some would have their recommended volume of fluid to be inserted. Okay, then this would be your tip. Then this would be your drain, drainage. Okay, then this would be your balloon. So another type would be your hematuria catheter. So this would be usually a hematuria catheter, meaning a uh, catheter used when patient have or has uh, gross hematuria. Okay, so what is, what's the difference? There will be your uh, irrigation fluid, okay? So this will still be your uh, balloon inflation, then this would be your access uh, port, okay? Then this will be your irrigating uh, port, okay? So usually we use a large bore catheters, 20 to 24, but but there are also um, other catheters available like French 16, 18, okay, and 20. This would be your straight catheter. Okay, it's one port usually, usually used during your intermittent catheterization, specimen collection, or those who, who you need to have a temporary drainage. Okay. So this would be your co color coding okay for your french catheter so orange means 16 or 6 red would be 18 yellow would be 20 um, purple would be 22 and blue would be 24. so about the balloon size okay so the routine balloon would be 5 to 10 ml usually for a french 16 catheter it's usually 10 ml as your french goes down okay so it uh, especially for pediatric so your balloon size would also be smaller. But for bigger catheters, like your uh, 24 French, you sh usually used for your post-TURP patients, and you should put at least 30 ml. Okay, for pediatric catheters, it's about 1.5 to 3 ml. So let's go to your urine bags. Okay, so this would be your standard urine bag. This would be connected to your access port. Then this would be your drain. Okay, this is a more complex urine bag, basically the same. The difference is this uh, urine bag, it prevents um, kinking, okay? And it can contain more volume. And this would be your leg bag, okay? For those with uh, chronic catheterization so that they can mobilize properly. So this would be connected to your uh, thighs, okay? But the collection is less. Okay, but the patient can properly ambulate. Let's go to anatomy. So this is your male anatomy. As you can see, this will be your male penal urethra. Okay, let's start with your uh, urethral opening. Okay, about 24 French. Then uh, it is about 18 to 20 cent centimeter long. So this will be your urethral opening, your fossa novac novacularis, uh, your penal urethra going to your bulbar, your bulbum membranous urethra, your prostatic urethra, then this will be your bladder neck, and then your bladder. For the female urethra, this would be your vagina, no, your vaginal opening would be here. Okay, this would be your uh, female urethra, about four centimeters uh, long. 
Okay, then this will be your bladder neck and then your bladder. For the catheter pearls, so how do you do your proper urethral catheterization? So first is to observe proper sterile techniques. So any break in your sterility, okay, it increases the chance of having your catheter-associated UTI in the patient. So one common problem would be your inadequate lubrication. Okay, so adequate lubrication means to inject 10 to 15 ml of lubricant into the meatus. Okay, so you use um, your 10 c syringe, put some KY jelly, and inject it to your meatus to properly lubricate your catheter. Third would be insertion of the catheter completely for male patients. A lot of um, your urethral injury happens when you inflate the balloon uh, when it is not inserted properly. Okay, So please be careful. Then you should fill the balloon once there is flow of urine. Okay? This is important because a lot of um, urethral injuries happen when filling the balloon Okay, uh, when it is not yet inside the bladder. Okay, So how do you check? First, it should be completely inserted for male, okay, until the Y. Then there should be urine flow. If there is no urine flow, then you can flush it with uh, sterile water, okay, to relieve from obstruction, okay, probably from the lubricant. Then you should also fill the balloon with sterile water accordingly, depending on the size. Then proper securing of the catheter, okay, to prevent it from um, having traction okay uh, an injury to your urethra or to your prostate then also use your proper catheter size for the patient then always uh, do your closed drainage system okay so it, this also prevents your urinary tract infection so proper urinary bag care, number one is to change your urinary bag. If this connection leak or any break in a septic technique happens to prevent your urinary tract infection. Keep it free from kinking uh, to avoid any obstruction. Keep the bag below the level of the bladder okay, so that you have a continuous flow. Do not rest the bag on the floor. Um, this to avoid your infection and accidental stepping on your bag. Then empty the bag regularly about two-thirds full and use a separate clean container for each patient and then use standard precautions like your gloves. So let's go to your male catheterization. Okay, so male catheterization is usually uh, done. Okay, as you can see, uh, you do your proper sterile technique. Then this is when you insert your uh, lubricant, okay, about uh, 10 to 15 ml. So as you can see, the, the urethra is straightened. So that's why you need to straighten your urethra so that you will avoid any obstruction. Okay. So any obstruction could happen uh, first. Uh, it could be from your bladder neck. Okay. Any contraction. Okay. Then next will be your uh, prostate. Okay. This will be more, more common in your elderly patient wherein they'll be having uh, enlarged prostates. Okay, then any part of the urethra could also cause obstruction, probably secondary to your stricture, secondary to your infection, and also your urethral stones. Okay. So for your female catheterization, as you can see, the, the urethra is much shorter, which is why you can insert it at least half okay, of the catheter. And then it is safe to uh, inflate it, okay, because of the uh, length of your uh, female urethra. So any obstruction, okay, could also be caused by your bladder neck, okay, or uh, urethral strictures or stones. So this would be an example of your suprapubic catheter. As you can see, this is your bladder, okay. Then this would be your catheter going outside, okay. Usually, this is indicated when um, when you can't or you, you don't have any access, okay, uh, going to you to to your penile urethra. 
So the indications for catheter insertion, uh, one would be your diagnostic. So what are the diagnostic indications usually in children and female? When you want to get um, adequate or proper uh, urine cultures, then one would be your output monitoring. Output monitoring usually for your critically ill patients, those with CKD, wherein you need uh, proper input and output monitoring for the patient. Okay, those with geotrauma. Okay, so geotrauma, uh, you also want to uh, to adequately monitor your uh, urine output. Okay, next would be your therapeutic. Okay, therapeutic is usually from your urinary retention. Uh, probably secondary to your benign prostatic hyperplasia, those patients with gross hematuria causing your acute urinary retention, secondary to, to the clot formation. Okay, so um, you insert your catheters. What are the contraindications for your catheter insertion? The absolute uh, contraindication is a suspected or confirmed urethral injury. A history of bladder neck closure or repair. Okay, uh, for this one, please refer to your urologist. Okay, so what are the relative contraindications? Would be your recent urethral surgery, a urethral stricture, okay, or your um, AUS, okay, or artif artificial urethral sphincters. So, what are the recommended catheter size, okay, for children? Okay, for a newborn, the recommended would be your 4 to 6 French. For patients 1 to 11 months old, it would be your 6 to 8 French. For patient 12 to 23 months, it would be 8 French. For those 2 to 6 years old, it would be 10 French. For those 7 to 12 years old, it would be 10 to 12 French. And for those greater than 12 years old, it would be 14 French or your 16 French for adults. Irrigation. Okay, when do you use your irrigation? Irrigation is to relieve an obstructed catheter. Uh, usually, you you use your sampling port. Okay, so how do you do this one? You disinfect the port and then use a large syringe and sterile irrigant to enter your sampling sampling port. Okay, continuous irrigation of the bladder with antimicrobial antimicrobials is not useful and is not recommended as a routine infection prevention measures. Meatal care. So do not clean your periurethral area with antiseptics to prevent your catheter-associated UTI because it promotes your um, antibiotic resistance. Catheter care includes gently cleaning the perineal area with soap and water during the patient's daily bath. So you need to remove any debris from the catheter. Let's go to your catheter-associated UTI. Okay, this is from your EAU 2020 guidelines. So what is your catheter-associated UTI? This is described as your UTIs occurring in a pers person whose urinary tract is currently catheterized or patient who has been catheterized within the past 48 hours. Okay, so one of the most common causes of uh, hospital-acquired infection is your catheter-associated UTI. So what are, is the most common risk factor is the duration of your catheterization. So the pathophysiology, so catheter-associated UTI, it changes the host defense mechanism which promotes your infection. Okay? There's easier access of your pathogens to the bladder. It also facilitates your colonization, okay? your epithelial mucosal damage, which causes uh, binding sites for your bacterial adhesins, causing uh, your infection. So how do you diagnose? Um, the signs and symptoms would be your new onset or worsening of fever, rigors or altered mental status, malaise or lethargy with no other identified causes, flank pain or costal vertebral angle tenderness, acute hematuria, pelvic discomfort, uh, dysuria, urgency, frequency, and suprapubic pain for those catheter that were removed uh, within 48 hours. So how do you diagnose? Okay, so it is defined by a microbial growth, usually by your urine culture of, of greater than 100 CFU per ml in a single catheter or greater than 100 midstream for those catheter removed within 48 hours. 
So pyuria or um, pus in the urine is not diagnostic for your catheter associated UTI. So management is limiting your catheterization. Okay, you should remove your catheter uh, once. Okay, it's not needed. So the alternatives to indwelling urethral catheterization will be your intermittent catheterization, usually used for your patients with spinal cord injury. Um, others would be suprapubic catheterization for those um, who have chronic catheters or for those who you cannot access your, their uh, ure uh, penal urethra. Okay, you can also use your hydrophilic coated catheters. This would be your um, siliconized catheters uh, versus your standard PVC catheters. This also prevents okay, your uh, urinary tract infection. So when do you diagnose okay, and when do you refer complication? So let's go to your blocked catheter. So it means uh, uh, the causes of your non-draining catheter. One would be your twisted tubing or your kink tubing okay, or urine bag. Then the siphon effects. Okay, then mucus plugging, catheter incrustation, usually for um, chronic catheters. Then there would also be your abnormal bladder contractions, uh, like your overactive bladder or your uh, bladders that do not contract. So gross hematuria, okay, so usually uh, this is common for patient post-surgery, like your TRP. Uh, for those patients with um, malignancies like your bladder tumor, okay, uh, your kidney tumor could also cause your gross hematuria. Others would be your infections, okay, probably secondary to your stone, okay. Uh, another would be your trauma, okay. So this is only 3% of referrals occurring in 30% of long-term catheter users. So you do not treat as UTI without systemic signs. So please change to a large bore three-way catheter with irrigation if needed, okay? So what is recommended for patients with gross hematuria is usually a large bore catheter, at least your 20 French catheter, or you could go all the way up to your 24 French catheter. So other common urologic surgeries would be your TRP and your PCNL or your percutaneous nephrolithotomy. So for your TRP, um, it is done for patients with enlarged prostate with moderate to severe symptoms of bladder outlet obstructions or those patients with acute urinary um, retention. Okay, so cystoscopy is done, hence there is no incision on the skin. There's no sutures then bleeding is controlled through your electrocautery. So post-operatively, so patients on Foley catheter and they are hooked to your cystoclysis to prevent formation of clots within the bladder. Okay, so how do you adjust or regulate your clysis? It usually depends on the severity of your uh, hematuria. Okay, for a clear uh, to fish wash clysis, you can uh, do your slow rate or KVO. Okay, but if, if the uh, hematuria is severe, Okay, if it is uh, bright red, okay, then first you must refer it to your urologist and you adjust your clysis until it clears up. Okay, so your Foley catheter balloon should be inflated to about 30 cc or more, especially for post URP since the fossa is enlarged. Okay, you don't want your balloon to be inflated or stay in your prostatic fossa. So this would be your picture of your TRP. As you can see, this would be your TRP instrument. Okay, this could be your monopolar or bipolar uh, TRP. So this is your uh, scope, okay, the irrigation fluid. This would be your prostate, okay, as, as you resect your prostate, this would be your prostatic chips, okay. So as you can see, as you remove your prostate, okay, it, in, it, it enlarges your pros, uh, prostatic opening. So this will be your source of your bleeding, okay? So post-op care. So if there is hematuria, okay, per Foley catheter, even on, on fast clysis, okay? So it indicates your uncontrolled bleeding, okay? 
Okay. So watch out for urinary retention. Okay. Secondary to your to your for, form clots. Okay. Uh, since you have a crisis, then your bladder would distend faster. Okay. Then the patient would complain of your suprapubic pain. Okay. Uh, other signs would be your pericatheter urine leak. It means that uh, the, your your catheter is obstructed. That's why the urine okay passes through the side of your catheter. Okay. So there will be also be urinary urgency. Okay, suprapubic pain, as mentioned earlier. Then also, of course, you inform your attending urologist. So percutaneous nephrolithotomy. So this is um, a minimally invasive procedure wherein there will be a small incision, okay, wherein a nephroscope will be inserted, okay, and then your nephrolith or your kidney stone would be um, removed, okay, either through laser, okay or ultrasonic or your pneumatic um lithoblast okay to remove your stones okay so uh, how so another example okay so it's only a small tube wherein your stones could be removed so post pcnl how do you monitor your nephrostomy tube usually uh, the patient would have a nephrostomy tube post-operatively and your uh, urinary catheter okay um, usually also the patient would have your dj stent okay so how do you monitor for your nephrostomy tube and also your catheter uh, you, you should adequately monitor your, your output okay um, then you should also mention okay what is the color okay if it is uh, clear fish wash or if it is bright red um, in color okay so watch out for your tube placement and kinks and of course you need to dress your post pcnl site properly to, in, to to avoid your infection so as mentioned okay you also monitor your urethral catheter for output color and your placement so other Things to look out for is your fever, chills, nausea and vomiting, a shortness of breath, flank pain, expanding hematoma, or mental status changes. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you learned something. Good day, everyone.
Cornelia C. Bursalas Mazendo MD, FPCP, FPSN. She is a graduate from the College of Medicine of Pamantasan Nang Lungsod Nang Mainila. She had her residency training in internal medicine from Hospital Nang Mainila and nephrology fellowship training from Santo Tomas University Hospital. She is currently a practicing nephrologist in General Santos City. Good morning. I'm Dr. Arnelia Bersales Masendo, a practicing nephrologist from General Santos City. Before my talk, I would like to thank the Philippine Urological Association, Mindanao Chapter, for giving me a chance to be part of their third online postgraduate course, Ur Urology Practice Hacks version 3.0. My talk uh, for today is when to call your friendly urologist from a nephrologist standpoint. The objectives of this talk is to be able to recognize the need to refer patients to a kidney specialist, to be able to differentiate a nephrologist from a urologist, and to be able to recognize the situation when a nephrologist needs to refer patients to a urologist. So what's the difference between nephrology versus urology? Nephrologists and urologists can treat kidney-related conditions. It can even be easy to confuse the services of a nephrologist for the services of a urologist. These specialties of medicine can even overlap, and you may need to see both for the same condition. So should you see a urologist or a nephrologist? What are nephrologists and what do they treat? Nephrology is a subspecialty of internal medicine. Nephrologists diagnose, treat, and prevent conditions and diseases related to the kidneys. They treat patients with kidney disease and hypertension or diabetes. They specialize in treating people whose kidneys are at or near failure. So what do they treat? Nephrologists treat patients with proteinuria or hematuria, patients presenting with urinary tract infection, nephrotic syndrome, lupus nephritis, and adult dominant polycystic kidney disease. Nephrologists even treat kidney stones through medical expulsive therapy, as well as in prevention in recurrence of kidney stones or prevention in increases of kidney stone sizes through medical treatment. Nephrologists treat renal failure, both acute renal failure or chronic renal failure. They also treat glomerulonephritis and tubulointerstitial nephritis. Nephrologists also treat diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, hypertension and hypertensive nephrosclerosis. They also treat patients with gouty arthritis and gouty nephropathy, as well as patients with kidney cancer. A nephrologist can also be involved when other factors cause kidney disease or dysfunction, like acute renal failure of whatever cause. The renal failure can be secondary to pre-renal causes, renal causes, or post-renal causes. A nephrologist can be called in to co-manage. Patients with persistently elevated serum creatinine or chronic kidney disease are usually being co-managed with a nephrologist to help prevent rapid progression of kidney failure. Patients with severe or difficult to control hypertension are also being referred to a nephrologist. Patients with diabetes mellitus, especially those already presenting with proteinuria, are also being co-managed with a nephrologist. Electrolyte imbalances like hyponatremia, hypor, hypokalemia, hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia. Nephrologists are also being called to co-manage these patients. Patients who need renal replacement therapy or dialysis treatment, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, are usually under the services of a nephro nephrologist. Patients with chronic QTI are also being referred to a nephrologist as well as patients with autoimmune diseases, most especially SLE, because a majority of these patients already has an underlying lupus nephritis. And patients taking any kind of medications, most especially NSAIDs and other chemotherapeutic agents with side effects to the kidneys, the nephrologists are also being called to co-manage these patients. 
So what are urologists and what do they do? Urology is a subspecialty of surgery. Urologists diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases and conditions related to the urinary tract in men and women. They also diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases and conditions related to the male reproductive system. If your physician thinks you may need treatment for a condition relating to your bladder, urethra, ureters, kidneys, and adrenal glands, they might call your urologist. So what do they treat? They treat incontinence, erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, obstructive uropathy, kidney stones. They also treat urinary tract infection, especially when referred by a nephrologist for further evaluation and management. Patients presenting with pelvic prolapse problems. Cancers of the bladder, penis, testicles, and adrenal and prostate glands are usually under the services of a urologist, as well as any genetic anatomical kidney defects must be referred to a urologist. So when do a nephrologist refer their patients to a urologist? One, presence of hematuria. Gross, painless hematuria in adults can be temporary condition caused by infection, injury, or overexercise. Microscopic hematuria in adults over the age of 50 years old. These patients must be referred to a urologist. After complete evaluation and initial treatment, persistence of the hematuria could indicate more serious conditions, such as bladder infection, kidney infection, kidney stones, or other malignancy of the bladder, kidney, or prostate. Hence, they must be referred to, an, to a urologist for further evaluation and management. Urinary incontinence. Over, it's an overactive bladder. It is the loss of bladder control. It is a common and often embarrassing problem. The severity may be from leaking urine when you cough or sneeze or to a sudden urge to urinate that you don't even get to a toilet on time. Especially if it already affects your daily activities, you need to see or to be referred to a urologist. Dysuria. In women, this can be caused by urinary tract infection. In men, the most common causes are urethritis and certain prostate conditions. Other causes of dysuria which might need further evaluation would be bladder stones, cystitis, kidney stones, chlamydia, sexually transmitted disease, prostate inflammation, and other forms of infection. Pain in your lower stomach, side, or back or groin region can be a symptom of kidney stones. Hence, they must be also referred to a urologist. This is, usually, this is usually noted the severe pain when standing or even sitting or lying down, associated with hematuria and difficulty in urinating. When there is already accompanying nausea, vomiting, and fever due to infection, this can lead to urosepsis. These symptoms can also indicate other urologic problems. And if they are left untreated, lifetime recurrence rates are 60 to 80 percent and they can even cause permanent kidney damage. Hence, they must be referred to a urologist for prompt evaluation and further management. Fallen bladder protrusion or cystocil. Supportive tissues around the bladder and vaginal wall weaken and stretch, allowing the bladder and the vaginal wall to fall into the vaginal canal. 50% of mothers experience this problem, and the factors that can cause it to develop are usually aging, family history, obesity, intense physical activity, constipation, frequent coughing, and multiple vaginal childbirth. These patients must be referred to a urologist. Symptoms of bladder prolapse would include tissue in or protruding from the vagina, pain in the pelvis, difficulty in urinating, feeling of incomplete voiding, urine leakage during sneezing, coughing, or exertion, increased frequency of bladder infections, as well as painful intercourse or persistently low back pain. Presence of hernia. The inguinal canal is a passageway for the spermatic cord and blood vessels leading to the testicles. 75 to 80% of hernia are usually either inguinal or femoral hernia. They are, there are swelling or bulge in the groin or scrotum, which is usually noted when standing and disappear on lying down. Coughing or straining can make it even more noticeable. These patients, we usually refer them to the urologist for further management. 
male sexual problems like erectile dysfunction. This is the inability to achieve and sustain an erection suitable for sexual intercourse. They must be referred to a urologist. Estimated 20 to 30 million Americans have this and then more than 90% are embarrassed to seek treatment. This erectile dysfunction may indicate more serious medical problems like cardiovascular disease, depression, infection, diabetes, presence of bladder stones, prostate inflammation, and other form of infection. And there must be further evaluation and management by a urologist. In large prostate gland, we also refer patients to a urologist. The prostate is a male gland located just below the bladder surrounding the urethra. When enlarged, the prostate gland presses on the urethra and blocks the urine flow. This usually occurs in males more than 50 years old. We usually monitor for the prostate-specific antigen to rule out prostate gland cancer. Symptoms may be hematuria, pain or burning sensation while urinating, frequent urination, and pain in the lower back. Obstructive uropathy. Any form of obstruction, we usually co-manage patients with a urologist. When there is blockage of the urinary flow, that can occur at any level in the urinary tract. It may affect one or both kidneys depending on the level of obstruction. If only one kidney is affected, the urinary output may be unchanged and serum creatinine can still be normal. Usually, it is secondary to a urolithiasis or a benign prostatic hyperplasia. Infection within an obstructive system must be treated promptly. Initial treatment of an obstructive uropathy is directed at relieving pressure on the kidneys to prevent development of obstructive nephropathy and irreversible renal damage. Prompt relief of obstruction usually leads to preservation of kidney function. That's the reason why we usually refer patients to a urologist. And management would involve a urethral catheter insertion, insertion of a urethral stent or nephrostomy tube insertion, depending on the level and cause of the obstruction. Subsequent treatment is targeted toward the underlying cause. Presence of solid renal masses on imaging. A renal mass or tumor is an abnormal growth in the kidney. Whenever we see this on ultrasound or CT scan, we usually refer these patients to a urologist. Smaller masses most likely are benign, while larger masses likely to be malignant. Manifestation would include hematuria, weight loss, recurrent pain or fever, presence of lump or mass in the abdomen in physical examination. These factors would include smoking, hypertension, male gender, obesity, and patients on long-term dialysis. Urinary tract infection, which is being managed by a nephrologist, can also be referred to a urologist, especially when the UTI is, is in a solitary kidney or when there is presence of obstructive uropathy in a solitary kidney because this may lead to urosepsis and is life-threatening. Hence, referral to a urologist is needed. Many urological abnormalities will also present as UTI, like the vesico-ureteric reflex, the pelvic-ureteric junction obstruction, the vesico-ureteric junction obstruction, the primary mega-ureter, the neurogenic bladder, duplex system of the kidneys with or without ureterosil and the posterior urethral bulbs. They can present as urinary tract infection and we usually co-manage this with an urologist. Any penile cancer, testicular mass, or bladder cancer must be referred to a urologist. For penile cancer, may present with color changes, bumps, or thickening of the skin of the glands or prepuce, and can even involve the skin of the penile shaft. Or there is persistent discharge or bleeding. These factors would include smoking, the human papilloma virus infection, presence of hemosis or chronic irritation, lack of or late circumcision is also one of the risk factors for the de development of penile cancer. For bladder cancer, especially for people aged 50 years and older with unexplained microscopic hematuria or any age group with painless macroscopic hematuria, after further evaluation and management, we usually refer these patients to a urologist for further uh, evaluation and management. They may also present as abdominal mass, identified clinically or on imaging. 
the risk factors for bladder cancer would include hematuria, smoking, cystosomiasis, infection over the 40 years of age, and family history. Testicular cancer are painless testicular masses or lumps. Usually affects men between aged, ages 15 and 49 years of age. They may present as pain or discomfort in a testicle, sensation of scrotal heaviness. Testicular cancer can be reliably confirmed or excluded by a combination of clinical examination and ultrasound imaging of the scrotum. Male factor infertility. 35% of couples struggling with infertility, a male factor is part of the equation. Infertility in men can result from deficiencies in the sperm formation, concentration, or transportation. These patients are also referred to the urologist for further evaluation and management. Urologists can perform the following tests, hormone testing, scrotal ultrasound, post-ejaculation urinalysis, testicular biopsy, sperm function testing, as well as genetic testing. And any congenital urinary tract issues. Because if they are not recognized early, they can cause recurrent UTI and scarring in the kidneys, which will later develop into chronic kidney disease. And they can even affect the child's growth. Usually, they present as horseshoe kidney, renal agenesis, vesicoureteral reflux, multicystic dysplastic kidney, renal hypoplasia, ureterocele and ureteropelvic junction obstruction. We usually refer these patients to our friendly urologist. So is there an overlap between a urologist and nephrologist? Yes. Both specialists can help with the following conditions depending on their training and level of expertise. Both a nephrologist and a urolo urologist can treat or manage prevention of kidney stones. They both can manage patients with acute kidney failure, especially those secondary to an obstructive neuropathy. And both can evaluate and manage hematuria. It is not even unusual for a urologist and a nephrologist to get on the phone together to brainstorm a care plan for a challenging condition. Hence, a nephrologist and a urologist often work together to coordinate care plan for a single patient if an overlapping condition is present. And we usually do this. And I think that would be, that would be my last slide. Thank you for your attention.
Dr. Marie Carmela Lucido, Gamalio, is an obstetrician and gynecologist practicing in Cebu City. She had her undergraduate course at the University of the Philippine Cebu and finished medicine and internship at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. She had her residency training at Chonghua Hospital in Cebu City and is currently a member of the Philippine Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She also works as a medical officer IV in Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center. As doctors, we pride ourselves in our ability to single-handedly treat our patients. However, in the recent years, more and more patients come to us with multiple needs. Needs that sometimes you are unable to address properly for sheer lack of training in that particular field. Now, this demand has made it necessary to approach medicine as a cooperative science. An integrated team approach to healthcare, wherein there is a shared responsibility among varied specialties, is now preferred. Good day. My name is Dr. Marie Carmela Lucido Gamalio. I am a practicing obstetrician gynecologist in Cebu City. So my lecture today is all about when our department refers to our friendly urologist. So the following are my objectives. Number one, to discuss anatomy of the female pelvis in relation to the urinary system. And number two, to cite practical cases in obstetrics and gynecology where referral to our urologist is warranted. Let's begin with anatomy. So this picture was taken from Netter. It shows us the pelvic organs um, in relation to the organs of the urinary system, specifically the ureters and the urinary bladder. So as you can see, they are very much closely related to each other. Now, operative injuries to the urinary tract are a known complication of obstetrical and gynecological surgeries, primarily due to the anatomical proximity of the urogenital organ systems. Urinary tract injuries constitute an estimated 0.2 to 1% of all gynecological procedures and pelvic operations. Incidence is actually quite low um, for non-malignant conditions. And the injury rate may vary by procedure type as well as location. Although injury may be minor, delayed, or worse, a misdiagnosis on top of improper management can cause significant morbidity, even mortality. Let's begin with the first case. So case number one is 31 years old, gravity 2 para 1, 1001, 39 weeks age of gestation, admitted for scheduled repeat cesarean. Patient is status post primary low segment transverse cesarean for fetal malpresentation done 2019 and status post pelvic laparotomy, bilateral cystectomy, adhesion lysis done 2017. So as you can see here, intraoperatively, they incurred a bladder injury. Now, bladder injury is the most frequent urologic injury secondary to cesarean. This occurs most commonly during the separation of the bladder from the lower uterine segment. Now, this is significant primarily because of the increasing trend towards cesarean delivery nowadays. Obstetricians need to be cognizant of potential complications. Fortunately, however, um, cesarean delivery has been associated with very low rates of maternal morbidity and mortality over the past century. However, the most common complication of pelvic surgery um, still remains to be your bladder injury. The incidence um, ranging from 0.8 to 0.94%. Okay. So if you read this journal, um, you, you know that urinary bladder injury is considered to be one of the obstetrician's nightmare. As we all know, urinary bladder, by virtue of its anatomy, is an adjacent um, viscous to the uterus. And so it's very much susceptible for intraoperative injury during cesarean sections. Although cesarean delivery remains to be a cornerstone of obstetrics, there is still a paucity of data in the literature. 
either supporting or refuting specific techniques that we perform today. And so for any injuries incurred during a cesarean delivery, we need to refer to subspecialties. Okay. Okay, so the incidence of bladder injury has been reported to be 0.27% for primary cesarean delivery and 0.43 to 0.81% for repeat cesarean. The following are the risk factors for uh, bladder injury. So number one, you have your primary cesarean. So the reason that primary cesarean is considered to be a risk factor because the index patient surgery can form adhesions. And the incidence of adhesive disease after primary cesarean delivery ranges from 46 to 65%. Another risk factor is emergency delivery. So bladder injury was found to be more likely to occur um, when the surgery or cesarean was done as an emergency, because unfortunately, meticulous and careful dissection is not always the most important priority, um, especially when you are attempting to expedite the delivery of a distressed fetus. And then another risk factor would be labor or cesarean done during labor. So it is often more difficult to delineate the bladder from the lower uterine segment in the uterus that has been labored already. However, although incidental cystotomy was found to be higher in these patients who were undergoing cesarean delivery during the second stage of labor, this finding was still considered to be quite rare at 0.4%. And finally, another risk factor would be attempted vaginal birth after cesarean, which um, fails and then subsequently causes the um, repeat cesarean to happen. Okay, so finally, 60% of patients with bladder injury were found to have adhesions at the time of repeat cesarean delivery versus the 10% who had uh, normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. So for this case, we refer um, to the urologist in order to repair bladder injury. Okay, now let's proceed to case number two. Case number two is 37 years old, Gravida 4, Para 4, 4004, admitted for scheduled exploratory laparotomy, total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral, salpingo, ophorectomy, um, possible adhesion lysis. So the preoperative diagnosis was endometrioid adenocarcinoma, clinical stage 1A, to consider ovarian mass, probably metastasis, poorly differentiated, probably metastatic by frozen section. So as you can see here in the picture, intraoperatively, they incurred a complete resection of the right ureter. So when a ureteral injury like this occurs, quick recognition and a working knowledge of its location and treatment are absolutely essential in order to provide the patient optimal medical care. So this is the anatomic course of the pelvic ureter. So it is 25 to 30 cm in length, and it has two areas where it courses. You have the abdominal area and the pelvis. For the abdominal area, the ureter is located anterior to the psoas muscle. And then once it enters the pelvis, it crosses the internal iliac veins and at the level of the bifurcation, and then travels posteriorly to the ovarian vessels. So this is where the term water under the bridge was coined. Okay, so the frequency of ureteral injury following gynecologic injury, gynecologic surgery um, historically has been reported at approximately 1%. So surgery in gynecology is associated with injuries to the ureter. So this is due to the close association of the ureter with structures involved in these particular surgeries. Overall, uh, uteral injury is quite rare. The most common cause is iatrogenic trauma during open surgery, laparoscopic, or certain endoscopic procedures. In gynecology specifically, um, the following procedures increases risk for uteral injury. 
So we have oophorectomy, hysterectomy of any approach, um, open, laparoscopic, or vaginal, but more so for the laparoscopic, pelvic organ prolapse repair, and even described as a rare complication in transvaginal oocyte retrieval for in vitro fertilization. I'm sorry. So ureteral injury is one of the most serious complications of gynecologic surgery. It is less common than injuries to the bladder or the rectum. However, ureteral injuries are far more serious and troublesome when they are unrecognized and they are often associated with significant morbidity. Okay, so the following are the risk factors for ureteral injury. So we have um, enlarged fetus by virtue of um, by virtue of the size, it causes distortion in the anatomy. And so there might be difficulty in visualizing properly your ureter. And then number two, three, and four, you have your previous pelvic surgery or radiation, advanced malignancy and pelvic endometriosis, all of which increases the risk for development of adhesions. And then other risk factors include adhesions in itself, distorted pelvic anatomy, maybe congenitally, and then you have your coexistent bladder injury, and finally, massive intraoperative hemorrhage. So if you try to look at it, anything that can obscure um, proper visualization of the ureter is considered a very big risk factor for its injury during an operation. Okay. Now, this table tells us of the risk of ureteric injury in different obstetrical and gynecological procedures. So as you can see here, in obstetrics, the highest risk comes when you do a cesarean hysterectomy. Number one, it is emergency, and so you have to expedite the removal of the uterus, um, not thinking so much of the anatomy or where you are clamping. And then for gynecology, um, it's also very high risk in your abdominal hysterectomy. Now, despite the very low incidence of ureteral injury, prevention and detection remains to be critical, as I've been repeating over and over, to the overall outcome of the patient. And so anticipation and a high index of suspicion, along with proper urological referral, appropriate investigation of the urologic injury is of paramount importance. Now let's go to case number three. So case number three is 38 years old. Gravida 1, Para 1, 1001, came in for a new urinary leakage from the vagina. So patient was status post outlet forceps extraction. And then um, she was discharged unremarkable. However, two days after, patient started complaining of leakage from her vagina. So CT scan was done with contrast that revealed um, vesicovaginal fistula. Okay. Now vesicovaginal fistulas in the females are often the result of obstetric trauma in third world countries and gynecologic surgery in developed countries. <clears throat> Improvement in obstetric care and the increased use of cesarean section has resulted in the decrease in the incidence of obstetric fistulas. However, the incidence of fistulas as a result of surgery has remained relatively unchanged for years. So again, this is another reason wherein we refer to the urologist to help with the repair of the fistula. So we have what we call your vesicovaginal, and in other cases, we can also develop uterovesicovaginal utero fistula. But that is more common in gynecologic surgeries. <clears throat> Case number four. Case number four is a 36 years old, newly gravid, previously diagnosed with pelvic endometriosis. Patient also has multiple uterine myoma. Uterus was measured 20 cm from the symphysis pubis, and the transvaginal ultrasound revealed deeply infiltrating endometriosis. 
So what is pelvic endometriosis? Pelvic endometriosis is often a painful disorder when endometrial tissues grow outside of the uterus. So this commonly involves ovaries, fallopian tubes, and tissues lining the pelvis. Endometrial-like tissues thickens, breaks down, and bleeds per menstrual cycle. And what happens, or what happens is that the surrounding tissues reacts to this um, a causing adhesions to form. So pelvic endometriosis is notorious for um, adhesions. Specifically, what we call your deep endometriosis, this is considered to be the most severe form of pelvic endometriosis. It can occur in 20% of women with pelvic endometriosis. This, are, this, this is described as implants with a depth of 5 millimeters or more. Now, medical treatment can be used to manage endometriosis with good effect. In fact, in the Philippines, the practice really is to manage these patients um, medically. However, there are <clears throat> situations wherein surgical intervention must be done. Situations, for example, there is obstruction already. So deep endometriosis often requires um, surgical resection of the lesions, especially when complications occur. And because of the location of the endometriosis, um, there might be a need to refer to other specialties, such as urology and also to general surgery, especially when resection happens in the bowels. Okay? So when there is already involvement of the ureter, either directly or indirectly, through scarring and distortion of the normal anatomy secondary to the, uh, pre uh, secondary to the pelvic endometriosis, input by a urological surgeon is often required in order to have a complete and safe resection of the disease. Now, the NICE recommends, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, actually recommends that centers provide specialist care for endometriosis as multidisciplinary teams um, is required in order to address the problem. And of course, urologic surgeons should be part of that team. So for this particular case, uh, pre-op referral to a urologist is warranted. Number one, you have the presence of the pelvic endometriosis, and so you would assume or you would presume adhesions, uh, massive adhesions upon opening up. Also on top of that, you have multiple uterine myoma. So the use of the pre-op stenting for this particular patient would be, number one, to allow good visualization um, of the ureter itself and assist in its palpation. And when you have this, it's much easier to detect any type of intraoperative, intra, any type of ureteral injury intraoperatively. Okay, so urological input can also be required for other reasons. So number one, um, for patients who are preoperatively found to have hydronephrosis with or without the loss of renal function, Number two, when there is, you expect extensive intraoperative dissection around the ureter and you are concerned of a possible ischemic or thermal damage to the ureter. So they usually advise them to have JJ stenting. And then finally, reconstructive urology input can also be arranged for patients who experience a severe ureteric stricture, um, which of course would require reimplantation of the ureter. Secondary to previous surgeries. Okay, so as I've mentioned earlier, for patients with apparent risk factors, um, prophylactic placement of stents may be useful. And although some studies have failed to demonstrate a reduction, <clears throat> excuse me, in iatrogenic injuries, placement remains safe and associated with very few complications. So it does not entirely prevent injury, but it can aid in the early diagnosis and prompt treatment of the injury. Okay, so another urological procedure for which we refer to a urologist, aside from your 
um, placement of stent would be cystoscopy. Okay, so cystoscopy is a preferred method for the detection of intraoperative bladder injuries. So they are able to localize lesions in relation to the position of the trigone and ureteral orifices. Okay, so in order to detect urinary tract injuries, specifically in your urinary bladder, then you may opt to do a cystoscopy intraop. Okay, however, it has been noted that it has no clear post-operative um, recognition impact. Okay, so although routine cystoscopy clearly increases the intraoperative detection rate of urinary tract injuries, this systemic review, uh, mostly retrospective study, shows that it does not really appear to have much effect on the post-operative injury detection rate, as I have already mentioned earlier. However, we still can do or opt to do cystoscopy, especially for surgeries um, in the repair of uh, pelvic organ prolapse, as well as for procedures such as the total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingectomy, which are considered to be complex. Okay? Um, the adjusted ureteric injury rate for these cases is about 0.03%. So there is a clear decrease. Okay, now let's go to case number five. So case number five is David and Lucy, primary infertility for 10 years. Um, to consider male factor. So the ultrasound revealed a bag of worms in the scrotum. Okay? So infertility is a disease characterized by failure to establish a clinical pregnancy after 12 months of regular and unprotected sexual intercourse. It is estimated to affect 8 to 12% of reproductive age couples worldwide. Males are solely responsible for 20 to 30% on infertility cases, but contribute to 50% of cases overall. So male infertility may be due to either testicular or post-testicular deficiencies. So the diagnosis for this particular case is varicocele. Now, the relationship between varicocele and male infertility has been a matter of debate for more than half a century. Nonetheless, varicocele remains to be the most common correctable cause of male factor infertility, but some men with varicoceles are able to father children even without intervention. While others who have been treated, um, some men are, um, in addition, improvements in semen quality after varicocelectomy do not always result in spontaneous pregnancy. And so there is really no clear relationship just yet. However, um, several studies have seen uh, improvement in the improvement in the semen quality of these patients. And so current evidence actually suggests a beneficial effect of varicoselectomy on semen quality and pregnancy outcomes, especially in couples with documented infertility only if the male partner has a clinically palpable varicocele and affected semen parameters. Now, varicocelectomy is actually the most common um, outpatient referral we make to our urologists. Okay, so in summary, anatomy is the um, in summary, anatomy is the defining factor that dictates the risk for urinary tract injury. Okay, so urinary tract organs being very closely related to pelvic organs, we really cannot expect. Um, we really expect that once you do surgery on one organ system, you expect the other organ system to be affected. Okay, so urological complications commonly occur secondary to obstetrical and gynecological surgeries by virtue of its anatomy. And iatrogenic trauma to urinary tract organs is the most common cause of urological complications. And so, 
we refer to the urologists in both obstetrics and in gynecology. In obstetrics, for urinary tract injury, secondary to childbirth, surgical complications in the urinary bladder, and as I have mentioned in the previous case, you have different urological procedures. Uh, more commonly, it has something to do with the bladder because that is what's directly um, very much closely um, located to your uterus. And then for gynecology, again, we refer for surgical complications to the urinary tract, most commonly your ureters. And then if you have bladder or urinary tract procedures, such as the stenting or the input of other, um, other things. And then finally, um, we have the most common outpatient referral, which is your varicosolectomy. Okay, so as you can see in all of the cases, we had to refer to a different subspecialties. Now, most researchers nowadays have found that when healthcare professionals work together, such as in these cases, the risk for medical errors is reduced and the level of patient safety rises. Now, this ensures an improved patient-centered care for the long term. And so when you feel that there is a need to refer, then we should just go ahead and refer. They are our friends after all. So thank you for your kind attention and God bless.
Dr. Anan Pablita Oamata. She is a pediatric nephrologist in Cagayan de Oro City. She finished medicine at Xavier University. She had her pediatric residency training in Northern Mindanao Medical Center and fellowship training in pediatric nephrology at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. She is a diplomat of the Philippine Pediatric Society, Philippine Society of Nephrology and Pediatric Nephrology Society of the Philippines. She is an active consultant at the Northern Mindanao Medical Center and an assistant professor at the Xavier University School of Medicine and La Cio de Cagayan College of Medicine. Good day. I am Dr. Ann Imata and I am honored to be part of this convention. I would like to thank Dr. Feliciano for inviting me. My topic for today is entitled, When to Call Your Friendly Virologist, a Pediatrician Standpoint. I have nothing to disclose, and these are my objectives. Let me start off by giving you a quick review of the burden of disease of CKD. Chronic kidney disease is an important contributor to morbidity and mortality from non-communicable diseases, and this disease should be actively addressed to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goal target to reduce premature mortality from non-communicable diseases by a third by 2030. Treatment costs for CKD rose after the 1960s with availability of renal replacement techniques making possible the long-term application of life-saving but costly treatment. The number of people receiving renal replacement therapy exceeds 2.5 million and is projected to double to 5.4 million by 2030. Globally, in 2017, 1.2 million died from CKD. The global all-age mortality rate from CKD increased 41.5% between 1990 and 2017. 697.5 million of all stage CKD were recorded, with a global prevalence of 9.1%. The prevalence of pediatric CKD ranges from 15 to 74.7 cases per 1 million children. Mortality among children who progress to ESRD is 30 to 50 times higher compared to that of the general population. This figure shows the age standardized rate of DALYs or Disability Adjusted Life Year for CKD in 2017. Disability Adjusted Life Year, as defined by WHO, is a time based measure that combines years of life lost due to premature mortality and years of life lost due to time lived in state of less than full health or years of healthy life loss due to disability. And look at the Philippines. We belong to the countries with very high DALI at 1,000 to 1,499 per 100,000 population. As a pediatric nephrologist, it is a challenge for me to help kids at risk for CKD prevent permanent renal damage or at least delay progression of CKD. In the pediatric population, the most common cause of CKD is kakut or congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. It is characterized by structural and functional abnormalities of kidney, collecting system, bladder, and urethra. The effects can be bilateral or unilateral, and different aspects often coexist in an individual child. It constitutes approximately 20 to 30 percent of all anomalies identified in the prenatal period. It plays a causative role in 30 to 50 percent of cases of CKD requiring kidney replacement therapy in children. Patients with malformations involving a reduction in kidney numbers or size are most likely to have a poor kidney prognosis. The risk of chronic renal disease depends on the number of functioning nephrons at birth and thus on the history of preterm birth, the degree of renal dysplasia, and the presence of bilateral or unilateral involvement, as well as acquired nephron loss 
which in children is mostly due to the co-occurrence of upper UTI and persistent obstruction. Our goals are to minimize kidney damage, to prevent or delay the onset of ESRD, and to provide supportive care to avoid complications of ESRD. The phenotypic spectrum of kakut includes mild asymptomatic anomalies to life-threatening anomalies. Lower urinary abnormalities are identified in about 50% of affected patients and include vesico-ureteral reflux, which is approximately 25%, Ureteropelvic junction obstruction, which is approximately 11%, and ureterovesical junction obstruction. Kidney malformations are commonly identified in the antenatal period and account for 20 to 30% of all detectable anomalies. The most common kakut is hypodysplasia, which accounts for 57.5% of CKD patients. If these are undetected in childhood, it can present with renal problems in adulthood like hypertension, proteinuria, and renal impairment. This figure shows a graphic representation of the general classification of the various types of kakut. It includes a considerable number of diseases caused by defects in the morphogenesis of the urinary system including alterations in the number, size, and position of the kidneys, obstructive or non-obstructive dilatation of the urinary tract, and dysplastic kidney lesions, including cystic disorders. They may occur in isolation or in the context of a syndrome. I will be discussing some of the commonly encountered kakut that can be corrected surgically to prevent progression to CKD. First on the list is congenital hydronephrosis. It is a pathological condition in which the renal pelvis and renal calluses dilate as a result of stagnation or reflux of urine. Antenatal hydronephrosis is found in approximately 1 to 5% of all pregnancies, of which 41 to 88% of cases consist of transient hydronephrosis, or clinical and physiological hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis associated with UPJO is the most common variant, with a prevalence of 10 to 30 percent. Other conditions associated are VUR, ureterovesical junction obstruction, and posterior urethral valve. UPJO reduces the flow of urine from the renal pelvis to the ureter, causing dilatation of the renal pelvis and calluses, resulting in hydronephrosis. The etiology of UPJO is multifactorial, and both intrinsic and extrinsic factors are involved in the pathogenesis. Most cases of UPJO in children are caused as a result of intrinsic pathological factors such as the presence of hypoperistaltic ureteral segment, infoldings of the ureteral wall or true strictures. The rare causes of extrinsic UPGO in children are as a result of fibrosis band, kinks, or crossing vessels. Older children with symptomatic UPGO have high rates of extrinsic pathological factors. Crossing renal vessels occur in 11 to 15 percent of children with UPGO. However, in children with symptomatic UPGO, the incidence of crossing vessels was reported to range from 49 to 58 percent. Despite this association, the relationship between crossing vessels and UPGO is unclear. UPGO has the following manifestations. The rapid expansion of the renal collecting system, called intermittent hydronephrosis, by excessive intake of fluids causes abdominal pain. The disappearance of pain frequently reflects improvement in the hydronephrosis. If there are no urinary findings or if the symptoms are ambiguous, 
or there is only peri-umbilical pain, the patho pathology might be considered to be digestive tract disease and treated accordingly, which results in delayed diagnosis of UPJO. The affected renal function is often preserved because the obstruction is transient. Before the increased use of diagnostic ultrasound, an abdominal mass was one of the main findings of infants diagnosed with hydronephrosis. As most cases of hydronephrosis are now discovered by ultrasound before birth, the number of hydronephrosis causes the cases detected with the chief complaint of abdominal mass has decreased. The frequency of UTIs has been reported to increase as the grade of hydronephrosis increases during infancy. However, there are also reports that the rate of UTI is slow in cases of UPJO without VUR. The mechanism of UPJO and VUR co-occurrence has not been fully elucidated, but the risk of obstruction is said to be five-fold greater in cases of advanced reflux than in cases of mild reflux. Ureteral flexion and inflammation as a result of VUR are considered to be causative factors in hydronephrosis. Hematuria appears in half of the patients with intermittent hydronephrosis, and it suggests a major urinary tract problem. Hematuria can also occur after minor trauma or strenuous exercise, in which case it is mostly as a result of rupture of secondary mucosal blood vessels in dilated renal calyx and pelvis. Hypertension occurs in 5 to 10% of cases of UPJO. In children with hydronephrosis and hypertension, hypertension might be an indication for surgery. Blood pressure should be monitored in children with hydronephrosis to confirm the presence of hypertension. Non-invasive and simple ultrasonography is the basic examination for UPJO. The use of ultrasound to evaluate hydronephrosis is important for deciding the management. The SFU 1993 classification is used to evaluate ultrasound images. The SFU classification is regarded as a standard index for hydronephrosis diagnosis because the morphological descriptions in this classification are almost completely correlated with the clinical course. The anterior-posterior renal pelvic diameter is a simple, reliable, and widely used measure for surgical treatment. The following are the diagnostic imaging used for evaluation. DR, or diuretic renograph, is an important test for the evaluation of renal function and renal drainage in hydronephrosis. CT scan allows visualization of the upper or the entire urinary tract, including the middle and lower ureter, the bladder, and the urethra on a single scan. It allows the direct depiction of hydronephrosis beyond the midline and has played an important role in diagnostic imaging. Three-dimensional CT is carried out to show useful anatomical findings such as the presence of crossing vessels in surgical cases. MRI is a useful diagnostic modality for patients in whom contrast material cannot be used because of complicated kidney, urinary tract anomalies, or renal damage. It can also be used to evaluate the anatomy, renal blood flow, and excretory ability. It is useful for cases that involve complicated congenital pathological conditions and decreased renal function. A patient must undergo VCUG for the confirmation of VUR. The prevalence of UPGO concomitant with VUR in patients with hydronephrosis is 6 to 10 percent. Therefore, some consider that a VCUG should be limited to patients with ureteral dilatation on ultrasound or patients with repeated UTIs. Conversely, as the frequency of complications in patients with UPJO concomitant with VUR is 10 to 
and UTIs occur at a high rate in complicated cases. Others believe that BCUG should be carried out in patients with high-grade hydronephrosis. If VUR is identified, antibiotics should be administered prophylactically. The guidelines of the 2010 American Urological Association and the VUR guidelines of the 2012 European Association of Urology do not recommend VCUG screening for all cases of hydronephrosis, but recommends it only for patients with high-grade hydronephrosis, severe ureteral dilatation, or UTIs. IVP is used for the diagnosis of hydronephrosis because it can be captured visually. However, the standardization of VR, IVP is now carried out only for imaging cases suspected of special anatomical abnormalities. RP was carried out previously to obtain a definitive diagnosis of the site and the extent of obstruction not shown by IVP. Advances in MRI allow the visualization of complicated renal tract abnormalities, which has reduced the need for RP. The aim of diagnostic studies is to determine if surgery is required to prevent renal dysfunction based on the possibility of spontaneous improvement. Decision-making for treatment is based on a comprehensive assessment that includes patient's clinical course, ultrasound findings, and diuretic chronograph findings. So how do we manage UPJO? In symptomatic UPJO, surgical treatment is generally carried out. Abdominal pain as a result of intermittent occlusion is probably the most reliable indication for surgery. Recurrent UTI and hypertension due to obstruction are also indications for surgery. Asymptomatic UPJO is often found incidentally at ultrasound during the fetal, neonatal, and infancy periods. Reading by ultrasound findings is carried out as the initial evaluation. The SFU grade and the APD can help guide treatment decisions. For SFU grades one and two, Follow-up is regularly carried out every three to six months. More than 80% of asymptomatic mild hydronephrosis or those with SFU grades 1 and 2 patients spontaneously improve with stabilization of hydronephrosis by one year of age. If the hydronephrosis persists at one year, ultrasound every six months until three years of age is recommended. In patients with grade 3 hydronephrosis, follow-up is carried out every three months, and DR should be carried out if necessary, such as when hydronephrosis worsens. Many reports show that the risk of kidney damage is low for an APD of less than 2 mm, and that the rate of surgical intervention increases in APD of more than 20 to 30 mm or SFU grade of at least 3. In patients with an APD of 40 to 50 millimeters, early pyeloplasty is often carried out. In patients with grade 4 hydronephrosis, follow-up is carried out every 1 to 3 months, and further evaluation by DR is carried out. Moderate to advanced hydronephrosis or those with grades 3 to 4 might improve but is often an indication for surgery. Patients with grade 4 hydronephrosis are more likely to require surgery, although differential renal function and urinary drainage are evaluated by DR. The surgical indications are differential renal function is left of less than 40%, urinary retention, and differential renal function value reduction of more than 5 to 10%. If grade 4 hydronephrosis continues for more than 3 years, spontaneous resolution is doubtful and surgical intervention is recommended. The need for surgery increases with other concomitant urinary abnormalities, such as VUR and polycystic dysplastic kidneys. If both kidneys have advanced diseases, 
early surgery is generally indicated because evaluation might be difficult. There are no clear criteria for how long follow-up is required for patients treated conservatively. If hydronephrosis improves, follow-up can be stopped in one to two years. But even after improvement in hydronephrosis, during the follow-up period, the condition can worsen again after several years. It is necessary to explain to the patient's parents that the patient should be re-examined if symptoms appear after cessation of follow-up examinations. Some recommend continuous antibiotic prophylaxis because of the greater risk of UTI in advanced hydronephrosis than in mild hydronephrosis. However, there is little evidence and no consensus has been established. If advanced hydronephrosis continues for a long time, the prognosis of renal function is poor and advanced hydronephrosis does not meet the criteria for surgery and continues for more than three years, spontaneous improvement cannot be expected, and surgical rec intervention is recommended. According to some reports, hydronephrosis after pyeloplasty improves. It disappears in 80 to 90 percent of patients, remain unchanged in 10 to 20 percent, and worsens in approximately 5% of patients. Ultrasound is recommended as a standard evaluation for post-operative follow-up. DR is not essential, except in cases of suspected aggravation of hydronephrosis. Although renal function might change several years after surgery, it has been reported that renal function stabilizes within approximately five years and is maintained for a long time thereafter. However, decreased renal function has been observed in approximately 28% of patients, and occurrence is seen after at least five years in 1.3 to 4% of patients. Renal complications, such as hypertension and proteinuria, develop 15 to 20 years after surgery. I found this case report in Japan late last year about a two-year-old child who was initially diagnosed with bilateral hydronephrosis antenatally. Ultrasound done immediately after birth revealed bilateral SFU grade 4 hydronephrosis. VUR was ruled out by VCUG. BMSA was done at one and two years of age, revealing right dominant SRF at 67%. He presented with sudden onset of fever and oliguria and was managed as a case of UTI. Ultrasound still showed SFU grade 4 hydronephrosis, prompting emergent drainage. A ureteral stent was inserted against the right UPGO. Percutaneous nephrostomy was performed in the left kidney because a stent cannot be inserted due to UV. VJS. The bilateral hydronephrosis was relieved immediately after emergent drainage and AKI was resolved after 48 hours. They did multiple surgical interventions for the urinary tract obstruction at 3, 7, and 12 weeks after the emergency drainage. Here we see two renal MAG3 scintigraphy done, one immediately after. Um, emergency drainage on the left panel, and the other one done six months after the last reconstructive surgery on the right panel. We can appreciate bilateral release from the urinary tract obstruction. The patient was conservatively managed or observed until he developed acute penal failure at two years old. An appropriate surgical intervention strategy for patients with severe bilateral UPGO is critical, as long-term high-grade hydronephrosis may affect renal function outcomes. Kono et al. recommend a close follow-up every one to three months with further evaluation by ronography for the conservative management of severe bilateral UPGO. The indication of drainage or pyeloplasty is determined if 
the bilateral obstruction pattern with decreased split renal function is less than 40%, grade 4 hydronephrosis is observed for 3 years, or if the patient is symptomatic during the neonatal period. They concluded in the study that urinary drainage or pyeloplasty should have been planned early, at least unilaterally before the onset of ARF because of decreased split renal function in the left kidney to avoid lethal complications and preserve renal function. Another urinary tract abnormality is VUR. It is a condition characterized by retrograde flow of accumulated urine in the bladder back to the renal calyx or to the kidney through one or both ureters because of immaturity of the preventive mechanism against reflux or failure as a result of anatomical or functional abnormalities. Primary VUR develops as a result of an impaired or immature preventive mechanism against reflux due to anatomical or functional congenital anomalies. Secondary VUR is that due to a defect of this preventive mechanism from organic obstruction and neurological dysfunction in the lower urinary tract. VUR is a major underlying precursor of UTI. It occurs in 36 to 56% 50 of children with UTI, and the detection rate increases with earlier age of onset of UTI. The frequency of renal damage increased with increased frequency of UTI, and renal scarring was found in 26% of patients who had no recurrence of UTI. 38% who had one recurrence of UTI, and 80% of patients who had two or more recurrences of UTI. VUR is often diagnosed in patients with febrile UTI. History taking, physical examination, urine test, and ultrasound must be included in the basic assessment. A thorough family history is particularly important because of the possibility of familial VUR. In patients with SFU grade 3 or 4 hydronephrosis with upper urinary tract dilatation, the presence of VUR should be determined using VCUG. The patients should be examined and treated for lower urinary tract dysfunction and bladder bowel dysfunction. It is suggested that lower urinary tract dysfunction characterized by increased residual volume and bladder capacity is involved in the occurrence of VUR before completion of toilet training. After completion of toilet training, dysfunctional voiding, overactive bladder, and infrequent voiding is closely associated with VUR. They proposed a new definition for DVD. It is a condition where either of the following exists. First, a symptom of lower urinary tract dysfunction which is basically identified with objective assessment tools such as urophlometry or voiding diary without clear organic factors in patients aged at least five years old who have achieved toileting independence or an abnormal, an abnormal abdominal and intestinal finding uh, which is described as frequency of bowel movement less than twice a week recurring absence of bowel movement for at least five days, frequent but small quantity of feces or fecal impaction in the rectum detected using abdominal x-ray or ultrasound. For the diagnosis and assessment, the following imaging studies are used. Urinary tract malformation can be accurately diagnosed by ultrasound. However, it did not detect any abnormalities in 46 to 60 percent of patients with VUR detected by VCUG. VCUG is a standard imaging test used for the diagnosis of VUR. It offers detailed anatomical information, enabling determining the presence or absence of VUR, and also the severity grade according to the international classification. 
DMSA renal scintigraphy is a standard imaging test used for the diagnosis of renal parenchymal damage and it is suited for assessment of split renal function and renal scarring in patients with VUR. Approximately 30 to 50% of young children with febrile UTI have VUR, and thus there is no clear evidence to rule out the fact that all patients with the first episode of febrile UTI should undergo VCUG. VCUG is also useful for assessment of functional and organic abnormalities of the lower urinary tract. And some patients with the first episode of febrile UTI need to be examined with VCUG. A retrospective cohort study that combined data from two previously conducted longitudinal studies the Randomized Intervention for Children with vesico ureteral Reflux, or the RIVOR trial, and the Care for Urinary Tract Infection Evaluation Study, or the QT study. Children younger than six years with the first or second UTI were followed up for two years. The objective was to determine whether delay in the initiation of antimicrobial therapy for febrile UTI is associated with the occurrence and severity of renal scarring. The exposure was the duration of the child's fever prior to initiation of antimicrobial therapy for the index UTI. In children with febrile UTI, they found out that delay in, in initiation of antimicrobial therapy was associated with the development of renal scarring. After adjusting other covariates, they estimate that a delay of 48 hours or more would increase the odds of new renal scarring by 47%. For recurrent episodes of UTI, PCUG should be carried out because they are highly likely to have the UR. Also, Given that febrile UTI is a precondition for renal scarring, febrile UTI recurrence is a risk factor. Thus, patients with recurrent episodes of febrile UTI need to be examined for renal scarring using DMSA renal scintigraphy as well as for VUR using BCUG. So who should be observed and who should be started an antibiotic prophylaxis? For children who have not achieved toileting independence, if they do not have febrile UTI, follow-up observation with optional cap or continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for grade 1 to 2 VUR, whereas cap is recommended for grade 3 or severe VUR. And cap should be considered in patients with febrile UTI. For children who have completed toilet training, follow-up is observation is recommended for grade 1 to 2 VUR without cortical abnormalities, whereas CAP is recommended for grade 3 to 5 VUR with cortical abnormalities. Follow-up observation will be considered even for grade 3 to 5 VUR if there is no renal scarring without febrile UTI. The rate of spontaneous resolution of VUR in infants within 1 to 4 years was 50%, with a slightly higher rate for girls. The rate was 71% if VUR was grade 1 to 3 and 28% if VUR was grade 4 to 5. The resolution rate was high in infants and VUR was resolved at a yearly rate of 9% after infancy. Follow-up after two years, on average, showed a spontaneous resolution rate of 51% and that the resolution was higher when the VUR grade was lower. VUR grade was bilateral and patients were younger and VUR was detected on screening for patients with fetal hydronephrosis or suspected familial VUR. CAP should be considered when VUR does not resolve spontaneously. CAP is widely accepted as a revolutionary conservative therapy for VUR because it prevents recurrent episodes of febrile UTI 
and consequent new renal scarring. The RIVER trial showed that CAP using a combination of phenytoprim and sulfamethoxazole reduced the occurrence of UTI by approximately half, from 27.4% to 14.8% in patient aged 271 months with VUR diagnosed after the first UTI, but did not prevent new renal scarring. It is noteworthy that the presence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria in cases of recurrent episodes of UTI was significantly higher in the CAP-treated group than the crop untreated group. Surgical therapy is to be considered for breakthrough UTI. The choice between CAP and follow-up observation is to be made based on patient characteristics, including age and the presence and absence of febrile UTI, lower urinary tract dysfunction, and constipation. Who should be started on CAP? For patients who are not yet tolentrate without febrile UTI, it is recommended that CAP be started before confirmation of VUR if, FS, if SFU grade is at least 3 and to be continued if VUR is confirmed. If febrile UTI is absent, these guidelines recommend CAP for grade 3 or severe VUR. But CAP is optional for grade 1 to 2 VUR. Patients with febrile UTI, CAP is recommended irrespective of the severity of VUR if febrile UTI is present, especially in patients less than one year of age. These guidelines recommend CAP if febrile UTI is present for patients with grade 1 to 5 VUR who have not completed toilet training. For patients who are already toilet trained without febrile UTI and DBD, CAP is recommended for patients with grade 2 to 5 VUR with renal cortical abnormalities. Otherwise, CAP is optional. For patients without febrile UTI but with BBD, BBD must be treated first. Given that the risk of febrile UTI is high in patients with BBD and CAP is expected to be effective in those patients, CAP is recommended for grade 3 to 5 VUR. For patients with febrile UTI but without BBD, CAP is the second choice after surgical intervention for grade 3 or severe VUR but is recommended only until implementation of surgical intervention or if surgery is not selected for some reason. For grade 1 to 2 VUR, CAP is optional. For patients with febrile UTI and BBD, CAP is recommended for grade 1 to 5 VUR with the precondition that the utmost priority is the treatment of BBD. And if surgery is indicated, surgical intervention will be chosen as the preferred option. Susceptibility of intestinal bacteria to antimicrobials and the possibility of emergence of antimicrobial resistance should be considered when choosing antimicrobials for CAT. A single dose between one-third and one-sixth of the normal pediatric dose should be given before bed. Penicillin antibiotics can be administered to infants less than two months of age. A single oral dose should be given before bedtime. Penitoprim and sulfamethoxazole are considered standard medication. However, they should be, not be administered to infants less than two months of age. At present, there is no clear consensus on the timing of discontinuation of CAP. And the following options are considered depending on the months or age and years at the start of CAP, at the completion of toilet training, after CAP for 12 years, even if toilet training has not yet been completed, and the confirmation of spontaneous resolution of UR, and at new onset of recurrence of breakthrough UTI. 
Indications for surgical therapy are the following. Breakthrough UTI and poorly controlled UTI. High-grade VUR. Renal impairment. Multiple UTI recurrences in patients older than those for whom CAP is indicated. And high-grade VUR with lower urinary tract dysfunction. Studies that examine VUR in pediatric patients with chronic kidney disease show that intermittent to severe proteinuria was associated with significantly higher rate of reduction in creatinine clearance than in patients without proteinuria or with mild proteinuria. Overt proteinuria is considered an index of poor prognosis and it was associated with an increased risk of progression of renal dysfunction and end-stage kidney disease. Conservative therapy and surgical therapy for high-grade VUR were investigated in several randomized controlled studies. A randomized controlled study examined two groups of patients aged less than 10 years old with grade 3 VUR for 654 months and found out that the incidence of renal scarring was not significantly different between the conservative group, 22%, and the surgical group at 31%, whereas that of febrile UTI was 22% in the conservative group and 8% in the surgical group, confirming the benefit of surgical therapy. I saw this prospective randomized controlled multicenter one-year follow-up trial comprised of 77 Swedish infants less than 8 months of age with VUR grade 4 to 5 who were randomized to CAP or endoscopic treatment with prophylaxis. When this study was initiated, endoscopic treatment had become a well-established method of treating VUR in older children. But there were only a few case reports of successful endoscopic treatment in infants with high-grade VUR. Since children with high-grade VUR have the highest risk of UTI during their infancy year, and the infant kidney is more susceptible to bacterial infection with increased risk of scarring, early intervention is desirable. The aim of this trial was to evaluate whether infants with high-grade VUR can be treated endoscopically, and if ET is superior to antibiotic prophylaxis and the resolution of the UR. They wanted to see if successful endoscopic treatment could prevent the development of bladder dysfunction and reduce the risk of UTI and renal scarring. However, this study did not show any difference between ET and CAP in reducing the risk of UTI recurrence and renal deterioration. Although the rate of VUR resolution was higher in the ET group and VUR greed at follow-up correlated with both UTI recurrences and renal deterioration. Female sex and blood dysfunction, especially increased residual volume, are positive predictors for UTI recurrences. The lack of statistical correlation between ET treatment and UTI recurrence may be due to the relatively small size of the study and short observation time. Another important reason may be the low recurrence success rate for ET in the most vulnerable children. So these are my takeaways for this lecture. Chronic kidney disease is often called the silent killer because it often has no symptoms until the late stages. Early detection of the primary renal disease and timely intervention are very important to prevent disease progression. As partners in this field with a common goal of preventing renal damage, we must work together in our fight against CKD and save the kidneys of our children. Thank you for your kind attention.
Jerome B. Basang, MD, DPAFP, MHM, MBA. Dr. Basang practices in Cagayan de Oro City as a medical specialist to and division head of outpatient and aftercare program at the DOH Treatment and Rehabilitation Center and a clinical consultant for family medicine, diabetes and hypertension of Polymedic General Hospital. He is also a clinical associate professor, part-time, of Lee Seo de Cagayan University College of Medicine. He is a graduate of Doctor of Medicine at the Jose P. Rizal School of Medicine Xavier University, a graduate of Master in Hospital Management and Business Administration at Jose Rizal University. He is a diplomat of the Philippine Academy of Family Physicians, certified specialist of Philippine Society of Hypertension and Ambulatory Diabetes Care Practice at the Institute for Studies on Diabetes Foundation Incorporated. Among his organizational affiliations and position are the following. President, Philippine Academy of Family Physicians Masamis Oriental Chapter. President, Diabetes Philippines Cagayan de Oro Chapter. Board of Director, Masamis Oriental Medical Society. Member, European Association for the Study of Diabetes. He is also into research with presentations at the second annual meeting of the Asian Association for the Study of Diabetes and 53rd annual meeting of the Japanese Diabetes Society in Okayama City, Japan, for the study entitled Impaired Fasting Glucose at the Northern Mindanao Medical Center, Impact Among Filipinos. Good day, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our friends from the Philippine Urological Association here in Mindanao for this opportunity for me to speak and talk on a topic that is very timely and very relevant in today's times, particularly in the advent of uh, the universal health care. And that is on the topic, family physicians and how our role in uh, referring urology cases. So for my disclosure, and the outline for today's talk, we will first review what family medicine as a specialty is, and then we will also touch on the family physicians and uh, their role in the universal health care. And then we'll talk on three cases, um, which I personally handled and referred to a urology specialist. And then we'll do um, a recap or a summary of um uh, the talk so what is family medicine well it is a specialty in medicine that provides um, continuing and comprehensive health care for the individual and the family encompassing all ages so that's from birth to old age and it also includes um all genders by integrating biological clinical and behavioral sciences so in essence, it is um, the center of primary care, and it is considered linchpins in the continuing continuum of care. The scope of family practice is not defined by diagnosis, nor it is defined by organ systems, nor by procedures, but by human uh, needs. Family physicians are trained in the biopsychosocial approach of healthcare management of patients, and this is because in family medicine, we believe that there is an interplay between the biopsychosocial um, factors. Um, some psychosocial factors can affect um, how the biological disease is handled or managed. And also um, the biological or the physical manifestation of the disease may also affect the psychosocial um, part of an individual. In the Philippines, the family physicians are members or, and are governed by um, the Philippine Academy of Family Physicians. What are the functions or roles of family medicine specialists? So basically, as I already mentioned, um, family medicine specialists care for patients regardless of age or health condition and thereby sustaining an enduring and trusting relationship. There is also this um, role wherein family physicians understand community level factors and social determinants of health, because in essence, family physicians can also act as community organizers or even social mobilizers. 
Now, family physicians serve as a patient's first contact for health concerns. So uh, they are the first contact uh, medical care providers. One of the very important role, or one of the very important roles of um, family physicians is that of navigating the healthcare system along with the patient, um, including specialist and hospital care coordination and follow up. Now, this I highlighted this one because it is exactly this role where we get to talk um, as we go along with this lecture. Um, we want to emphasize our um, position or our role in terms of um, navigating the healthcare system by uh, referral to specialists such as our urologists. Now, um, family physicians also use uh, data and technology to coordinate services and enhance care. And uh, one of the more most important um, role is that of uh, a family physician's ability to consider um, the impact of health on a patient's uh, family. Now, how about family physicians and the universal health care law? So recently on February 20, 2019, our president, um, President Rodrigo Duterte, signed this landmark law also known as the Universal Healthcare Law, or RA 11223. In this law, it contains comprehensive and progressive reforms that will ensure every Filipino is healthy, protected from health hazards and risk, and has access to affordable, quality, and readily available health service that is suitable to their needs. This also ensures that every Filipino should be able to access preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services. So this um, part of um, the healthcare system, particularly the preventive and promotive aspect, is um, part of the training of every family physician. In the universal healthcare law, when we talk about it, there is what we call the primary care focus system. Now here, families and patients will have a primary care provider. Um, the primary care provider under the universal healthcare law could either be a family physician or a generalist internist or a, um, a generalist pediatrician. So basically those who are accredited as primary care uh, providers. And this will ensure that um, the frontline services are strengthened. And then family physicians, therefore, play a great role in the implementation of the universal health care law. The primary care providers or family physicians refer to specialists when patients need tertiary or a specialist level of care. That's when um, this is a very crucial role because um, this will uh, enable the, the continuity of, um, uh, you know, medical care to a, a, to a patient if he or she needs um, a specialist uh, care. And that is why we are uh, talking about this topic now. Now, once patients are treated by the specialist, they are then referred back to the primary care providers. So, having said that, we now talk on um, the cases that me personally as a family physician uh, managed and um, had the opportunity to refer for specialist care, care of our um, urologist. So for case number one, we have FG, who is a 59-year-old female from Cagayan de Oro, uh, who came in with a chief complaint of left flank pain. The history of present illness, uh, two weeks prior to admission, the patient had onset of flank pain associated with fever and chills. She self-medicated with paracetamol that offered temporary lysis of fever. She also mentioned that their, her urine was cloudy, and she also self-medicated with cefalexin for three days, but offered no relief of the symptoms. 
the patient experienced persistent chills and high-grade fever, uh, reaching about 39 degrees Celsius, and it prompted the outpatient consult with the family physician. Um, at the out outpatient, CBC and urinalysis were done. The WBC on CBC was 24,000 with neutrophilic predominance. And in urinalysis, there was pyuria. The random blood sugar was also tested, and it was 456 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, uh, upon review of past medical history, the patient is a uh, known diabetic and hypertensive for more than five years already. However, she was lost to follow up from her uh, previous physician, and she is not currently taking any maintenance medications. So the patient was advised admission, and uh, at the wards, there was workup for sepsis, and then she was started also on IV antibiotics. Her blood sugar um, was controlled by initiating insulin administration. And then I did them some further work up to investigate on the um, cause of the infection. And a CT urogram was done. The impression on CT urogram was that of a left renal abscess, which measured um, 8.5 by 7.5 by 9.3 centimeters, infiltrating the perinephric space and the left psoas muscle. The psoas muscle lesion measured 7.6 centimeter by 2.6 centimeter by 4 centimeters. So because of this um, finding, I immediately referred the patient to a urologist. And upon further um Examination and evaluation, the patient underwent an ultrasound-guided drainage of the retroperitoneal abscess with pigtail catheter insertion. Eventually, the patient recovered and was discharged in food. Now, um, I took this from the PAFB website based on the Philippine clinical guidelines on the diagnosis and management of urinary tract infections among adults. Um, with strong recommendation and but with low quality of evidence, percutaneous drainage should be considered for renal and perirenal abscesses with sizes more than 5 cm. Open drainage should be considered for those with multiloculated abscesses and for those patients in whom percutaneous drainage is unsuccessful. Now, antibiotics should be given for a minimum of 4 weeks after drainage. So this is, was what exactly was done to our patient. And eventually, she recovered. She follow up, followed up with me with um, a relatively controlled um, diabetes. And she also followed up with um, the uh, urologist. And with latest um, follow-up, the ultrasound, I mean, on, on ultrasound, the kidneys were all... Um, normal. For case number two, we have EA, a 62-year-old female from Cagayan de Oro also, um, a known diabetic and hypertensive who came in with a chief complaint of hematuria. On um, HPI, she, the patient experienced on and off lung pain on the left side for several months already, but there was no consultation done uh, she just went on about her uh, daily life until recently when the flank pain became more frequent. Three days prior to consultation, the patient experienced flank pain again associated with occasional hematuria and she described it as light red urine. Hence, it prompted outpatient consultation. Um, the outpatient um, workup was also done. There was hematuria and pyuria on urinalysis. The blood pressure was elevated at 150 um, over one, 100 millimeters mercury. A random blood sugar was um, tested and it revealed a 245 milligrams per deciliter uh, result. The HbA1c was also uh, determined at 8.7%. On CBC, the WBC was 16,000 with a predominance of neutrophils. And there was uh, an elevation of the serum creatinine of 1.67 milligrams per dl. 
she was eventually admitted with an impression of an acute kidney injury secondary to acute pyelonephritis to consider nephrolithiasis and the diabetes type 2 uncontrolled. Now, um, at the wards, she was started on IV hydration. Um, IV antibiotics was also um, started. There was pain control as well as a control in blood pressure and blood sugar. Um, an ultrasound of the KUB was done and it showed shadowing echogenic structure occupying the left renal pelvis and mid to inferior calyces with a conglomerate measurement of 4 cm. The impression then was an obstructing nephrolithiasis on the left kidney and a simple renal cyst, cortical cyst on the right based on ultrasound. So again, this patient, because of the ultrasound result of, of an obstructing nephrolithiasis and the patient was symptomatic, the patient was referred to a urologist and subsequently, um, with the control of infection, the control of the pain, uh, the patient underwent percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, the patient was eventually discharged, improved. And at present, the patient followed up. The uh, serum creatinine became normal already. And then the blood sugar um, was improved from 8.7% HbA1c down to 6.9%. Now, based on the... NICE guidelines for renal and ureteric stone management. Patients who are 16 years or older that have renal stones that are larger than 20 millimeter, including a staghorn calculi, should be considered for PCNL or a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. This is exactly what was done to our uh, patient. And um, basically, um, the guideline was followed since the uh, stone was already four centimeter. The next case is that of a 67-year-old male. He is a retired bank executive from Cagayan de Oro, a known hypertensive, and came in at the outpatient with a chief complaint of urinary frequency. Um, on history, the patient has had um, urinary frequency for several months, initially mild until it becomes it became more frequent. There was training also while voiding, and there was dribbling. Your lower urinary tract symptoms were indeed noted. So because of this persistence, there, why this prompted the patient to consult with his family physician. And at the outpatient consultation, IPSS uh, score was 14, so that's uh, roughly around moderate um, symptoms. And workup was done with an ultrasound finding of an enlarged prostate of about 30 grams estimated size. And but the other findings are normal, were normal. PSA was uh, done with uh, 3 nanograms per ml result. The patient was prescribed with tamsulosin and dutasteride and was advised follow-up for possible referral to a urologist. However, the patient was lost to follow up because of um, uh, the pandemic. This happened during the uh, right before the pandemic. Now the patient came back for consultation after two years from the last consult. Now he his uh, chief complaint um, is hematuria. He claimed that he was lost to follow up because of uh, because he felt relieved of the symptoms when he was maintaining on medications for three months and also because of the pandemic. He came back because he noted recurrence of symptoms for at least a year now and noticed occasional gross hematuria along with other urinary symptoms. He also noticed weight loss. So eventually, the patient was uh, worked up again and the prostate size um, dramatically increased to 60 grams as well as the as well as the PSA now at 12 nanograms per ml. Um, the patient was then referred to a urologist for further evaluation and uh, management and subsequently the patient underwent surgical intervention and there was uh, and managed for prostate cancer. So 
um, according to the American Neurological Association guideline statement, an initial trial of medical management over four weeks with an alpha blocker um, for or PDE5 and over six to 12 months with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is reasonable in men with bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms. A referral to a specialist who can offer additional workup and treatment options is recommended for men who either do not improve with medical management or have symptomatic improvement but intolerable medica medication-related side effects. Likewise, the Canadian Urological Association states that Patients who experience a rising PSA after 6 to 12 months of 5-alpha reductase inhibitor uh, inhibitor therapy should be assessed for the possibility of high-grade prostate CA. So this was exactly what um, happened to our uh, patient. So um, having um, went through all those uh, cases, the three cases that um, we managed, what are the relationship between family physicians and specialist referrals? So as mentioned already in the previous slides, family physicians and primary care providers or primary care providers are the first contact medical care providers. Uh, on our end as family physicians, we should be doing comprehensive evaluation of patients through history, physical examination, and even ordering um, laboratory or ancillary procedures to arrive at our diagnosis. And these are very, very important so that we will not be able to miss out on um, some other details that could have been missed out with our um, history. Now, in essence, family physicians serve as triage officers because since we are the first contact care provider, it is in our, uh, it is um, our role to facilitate and coordinate referrals for appro uh, to appropriate specialties. So that is how important our roles, uh, our role is in the provision of medical care to our patients. Timely and appropriate specialist referrals improve patient clinical outcomes and reduces medical care costs. There have already been a lot of studies to prove this, that um, as soon as, um, for as long as our referral is timely and appropriate, then we will be able to do away with unnecessary um, expenses on the part of our patient. Especially as of this time, most of the expenses of our patients are out of pocket. And also, timely and effective referral ensures equitable access to specialist care. And um, under the universal healthcare law, this is actually one of the goals to be able to have an equitable access to specialist care through our uh, primary care providers. So when does a family physician refer to a urologist? Well, I uh, listed four. Um, general and very common um, conditions or situations wherein we as family physicians must refer to a urologist or to a specialist. One is when there is initial medical management or treatment failure. When, for example, uh, what happened to our uh, patient in case number three, there was um, an initial apparent failure of initial management on the BPA on his B, uh, BPH. Hence, he was referred to um, a specialist. And true enough, um, the patient presented with progressive symptoms. And um, just like um, what I stated here, uh, when patient patients present with progressive symptoms despite standard of care, then it is. Um, prudent for us um, to refer to a specialist, um, to a specialist. Number two is when there is a need for surgical intervention. Obviously, there are um, surgical interventions that need specialized training. And um, the urologist can perform special, specialized procedures that patients may need. 
So for example, in case number one and case number two, the patient um, the, the patients underwent uh, surgical procedures otherwise, that are otherwise um, not conducted by a family physician or not done by a family physician. So this is another um, situation where we need to refer to a urologist. The third is when a patient shows signs of a more serious underlying disease that is beyond the scope of primary care or family practice such as the possibility of malignancy. Going back to our third case, the patient um, presented with uh, a red flag sign of hematuria in the presence of the pH. So to further evaluate the patient and uh, evaluate for a possibility of malignancy, a referral to a urologist was, uh, was done. And true enough, the patient under um, had, um, what do you call this? had prostate cancer. And lastly, when there is a need for a patient to undergo further diagnostic evaluation that requires a lot of procedures or specialized procedures uh, to evaluate and manage the patient's case. So I think uh, these are the main situations where a family physician should be able to refer his patients or her patients to um, our, re uh, our friendly urologist. Now, having said that, family physicians should also follow through with their patients. It's not enough that we refer to a specialist. Our uh, responsibility as primary care providers does not stop at referral to a specialist. Why? Because after um, the specialist care ends, our patients are referred back to us for continuity of care. So as I mentioned here, family the family physician must be updated on the status of um, his or her patient's condition through collaborative efforts with the specialist because these patients will eventually be referred back after the specialist care ends. So in summary, family we, thought, we said that um, family physicians are at the forefront in primary care. And that family physicians or generalists navigate the healthcare system with uh, patients, including the referral to specialists, as well as hospital care coordination and follow-up. And lastly, a timely and effective referral by a family physician to a specialist improves clinical outcomes and prevents unnecessary waste of medical and financial resources. So with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, your kind attention, and I hope that you will all have a pleasant day ahead of you. Thank you.
Dr. Chrisley L. Go received her MD from the Royal and Pontifical University of Santo Tomas in Manila, Philippines. She has completed her internship and residency training in both neurology and psychiatry at the same institution in 2009. She pursued further training in the realm of movement disorders at the Center for Movement Disorders and Neurorestoration at the University of Florida in 2010. Currently, she is a Fellow of the Philippine Neurological Association and a Fellow of the Philippine Psychiatric Association, Inc. Upon return from training, she became the Chair of the Department of Behavioral Medicine and a consultant in neurology at the Jose R. Reyes Memorial Medical Center. She takes active part in holding several committees at JRRMMC including training and research of the residents there. Good day everyone. Thank you very much to the Philippine Urological Association, Mindanao Chapter, for inviting me to this year's postgraduate course. It's such a pleasure for me to give a talk on a topic that perhaps all of us have experienced at one point or the other during our medical career um, as we navigate through this pandemic. To begin, you can see here in this slide that the Commonwealth Fund looked at the widespread impact of COVID-19 on mental health. Um, and they had a total respondent, respondent of 8,259 from February to June 2020. They've listed here the share of adults who experienced stress, anxiety, or sadness this was, that was difficult to cope with the alone time during the pandemic. You can see all the countries have reported some form of impact and with the United States, uh, with the highest um, impact at 33 percent and on the right side you can see that the pandemic caused spikes in anxiety and depression from the time it started in 2019 up to December 2020 this is the data from CDC so before 2020, mental disorders were leading causes of global health-related burden, with depressive and anxiety disorders being leading contributors to this burden. The emergence of the pandemic has created an envirom environment where many determinants of poor mental health are exacerbated. So this report in The Lancet provides the first global estimates of the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in 2020 and suggests that, a million, that an additional 53 million cases of major depressive disorder and 76 million cases of anxiety disorders were due to the pandemic. So even before the pandemic, these diseases already can increase the risk of other health outcomes, such as suicide. Diba? We heard about the news on, on, at, on um, New York during the pandemic where the doctor or the nurse uh, jumped to his death, right? So this is causing a lot of uh, burden to us, especially as frontliners at, are at the front, front, forefront of the battle for uh, against COVID. So this study is the first to assess global impacts of the pandemic on major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders, quantifying the prevalence and burden of the disorders by age, sex, and location in about 204 countries and territories in 2020. You can see here that females are affected more often, okay, uh, compared to the males. And we don't know if this is, you know, due to underreporting among males, right? And younger people are more affected compared to the older counterparts. So some data that we have to know is that um, some uh, several reviews have already been conducted specifically for healthcare workers or frontline workers' mental health in the COVID pandemic. Uh, this, um, Papa et al. in 2020 identified 13 studies on uh, a search on the pooled prevalence rates of mental health issues among healthcare workers. And they reported that one in every five healthcare workers suffered from anxiety and or depression. And nearly in two, two in five reported some form of insomnia or sleep disorders. Vindigard and Ben Ross also reviewed, uh, made a review and they searched about 20 studies on healthcare um, workers showing that 
healthcare workers generally reported more anxiety and depression and sleep problems compared to the general population. And in China, where the, the, the hub of um, the pandemic or where, where everything started, uh, Liv et al. also surveyed healthcare workers before and during the outbreak. And this paper will come out actually in a Lancet uh, review uh, book. Uh, and it's about to be published pa lang. Um, they, they mentioned that among the 8,028 healthcare workers, they noted anxiety, depression, and insomnia um, were increased right among healthcare workers even uh, there's no difference between the start of the pandemic even after they've already put on the defense meaning the covid-19 um uh, defense were in place already like like um the, the isolation rooms the uh, the ppes all the the places uh, the infectious disease committees of their uh, institutions have already put those things in place. So regardless of whether or not um, they have those defenses in, they measured that anxiety and depression and insomnia were quite prevalent among healthcare workers. So in other words, the pandemic has caused a lot of unpredictability. And this, this is also synonymous with uncertainty, right? Changeableness, inconsistencies, and insecurities. And other specific healthcare issues that we have to work on or uh, that we have to deal with would be the increasing burnout. Even before the pandemic, we already see a lot of healthcare workers quitting. Diba? There's a lot of uh, attrition. Um, there's a lot of uh, burnout resignations among healthcare workers, whether they're doctors, whether they're nurses, or even students, right? And of course, there's also cultural expectations, which include uh, health seeking behaviors or of frontline workers. So, what do we mean by this? Well, there's an expectation that we know what to do all the time, right? Because we're doctors or we're nurses. Sa atin lumalapit yung mga mga relatives natin or uh, people that who know the kind of work that we do. And sometimes it's hard to show them that we ourselves don't really know what's going on or or we don't really specifically know uh, what to expect in terms of the pandemic, diba? And of course, uh, frontline workers are also at risk because um, there, some of them don't want to seek help and they tend to self-medicate, right? So there's a lot of um, a risk for those kinds of healthcare workers. And other worries, of course, include the safety of ourselves, uh, safety of our families, uh, fulfilling our duties, or whether we worry about our survival first, right? Or just quitting the work. And then during the height of the surge, we also we're able to see ourselves in the position where we have to choose who lives or who dies or who who gets the constrained healthcare resource such as a mechanical ventilator diba or the CPR team who who kung sabay-sabay sila dumarating sa emergency room or sabay-sabay sila sa covid ward nagde-deteriorate we don't know who to save first sometimes and of course we deal with the public mistrust where some of the people the lay laymen especially uh, they they accused us of um, parang faking it or parang exaggerating the COVID um, pandemic effects, right? So we there, there's a lot of news that I've heard that in the provinces, a lot of people do not believe in the COVID-19 or the social distancing protocols or the safety protocols because they feel that we're just exaggerating it to get some field health claims and and that can be burden burdensome to a lot of in the medical field. So other worries would include, of course, work-life balance because when there's a surge, there's a lot of issues about what what outlets we can get access to or how do we balance um, working with in, in terms of the safety and are we able to to, to spend some time with our family, diba? So, so the work-life balance is impaired, especially if we have to take on longer shifts, especially among the nurses, for example. And of course, uh, 
most of us have had to deal with a lot of losses, not just financially, but some of our relatives have also been taken away from us, right? And we also have issues on what's going to happen next because we are currently in the new normal, but there's still a lot of expectations as we deal with with. Uh, healthcare issues when we work in our clinics or when we work in the hospitals. So some news is that we remain to have low cases, diba? Right? So I think in the Mindanao area, it's not going to be more than 50 per day. But nationwide, the the daily positivity rates are, are quite low. And I think we just have about 1,000 or 1,200 plus uh, nationwide already so we remain to be on alert level one and people are slowly um, not really slowly but actually people are really feeling uh, the new normal okay so some of them have already moved on they've been partying shopping going out experiencing the life but for us hindi natin alam so paano naman tayo diba so we've we've really been with We've really been having a hard time um, in terms of um, dealing with the new normal. Good news is that you are not alone and hopefully this talk will be able to give us an idea on how to recognize those feelings like mental health issues that we have as frontliners and uh, also be able to manage them in a productive way so that we can be able to fulfill our duties as, as frontliners. So, the stress of social isolation, the worry about the jobs, you know, the money, our health, and profound feelings of loss that many of us are experiencing at the moment can trigger depression for the first time or exacerbate symptoms that we have already been diagnosed with, okay? Feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, or hopefulness, you know, changes in your, your mood, irritability, uh, loss of interest uh, in the most pleasurable activities such as um, hobbies, sex, or sports, sleep disturbances, you know, tiredness, and lack of energy, um, reduce appetite or weight changes or changes in um, eating patterns and um, all of this can be um, due to depression and we need to be able to recognize them because depression interferes with our ability to tr think straight or fo to focus with our work. So it also drains our energy and it helps, it, it, it makes things difficult to get through the day. So even as the country slowly begins to ease all these stay-at-home uh, protocols or the restrictions, the new normal is also fraught with a lot of mental health issues. Diba? Like when we go out, we know that we can go already go out, but you still have to wear the damn mask, right? We still have to be very careful about who we sit with, who we talk with. So it's really a little bit overwhelming um, in, in most cases, and especially for us. We're worried that we work in a hospital or a clinic, baka nahawa tayo, and then when we go out, it's it's a little bit problematic. Diba? So COVID-19 uh, affects depression or existing depression also in the following aspects, especially when we deal with distressing and uh, an uncertain period. And together with real life problems okay so it, it it's a really a big deal so isolation and loneliness fuels depression so as humans we are really social creatures and being cut off from the love support and close contact of family members and friends can trigger depression and and actually make existing symptoms or existing problems worse so months of this social distancing and sheltering at home or you haven't been able to go abroad if your your family is abroad or if you haven't been able to go to a different um, province because of your work or the restrictions can also make us uh, or fuel depression that is already existing and if you have a tro troubled relationship uh, being stuck there can also uh, fuel uh, depression so it's important you, that we have strong and supportive relationships um, are are that that are very crucial to the maintenance of our well-being so being forced to stay in a troubled and unhappy relationship that that 
it adds up to the the stress of the pandemic can also cause um, uh, depression. So anxiety can lead to depression with all the fear, all the uncertainty. Um, it, it it makes the worry spiral out of control, and they can cause panic and anxiety. And um, the, anxiety and depression can be due to the same biological vulnerability, and one can lead to the other. All right. So during this time, as frontliners, our stress levels are high, and um, there's a lot of changes that we have to deal with. Okay, and we often turn to uh, unhealthy ways of coping with the the pandemic. And what we need to to be wary of would be the word caution fatigue. So this occurs when people show low motivation or energy to comply with safety guidelines. Di ba nakita nyo yung news with the governor in um, Cebu uh, telling people that wearing masks uh, is already optional for them. But this was parang um, the IATF did not agree to this. But this governor was saying that um, the people has already been so um, sick and tired of all the restrictions. So this is uh, leading or the caution fatigue is already uh, there. You know, it sets in already. So pe people become impatient with warnings or we don't believe the warnings to be real or relevant or we try to de-emphasize the actual risks. And sometimes most, a lot of people we know bend the rules or even stop safety behaviors like washing hands, wearing masks, and social distancing. And anong pinaka-common sa atin is that we experience webinar burnout or Zoom fatigue. This is really real. Uh, I myself have experienced this. There's a lot of subspecialties and pharma companies. Uh, you want to learn, but the problem is that your butt sitting there and your, your eyes reading a bunch of slides throughout the day is just not going to cut it. Your attention span becomes less, you know, and you just don't want to keep on attending uh, webinars. So I hope this webinar on the post-grad, you're still attending and still attentive with the talks. Okay, so Zoom, Zoom burnout is very, very common. And what as frontliners, what's very important is to know compassion fatigue. It, it's actually secondary post-traumatic stress disorder whereby you've experienced so much stress, so much uh, people dying, so much um, um, uh, death around you so that you already experience physical and emotional exhaustion leading to a diminished ability for you to empathize or to feel compassion for others. And parang yung iba like for example in the covid ward we've seen this that uh, pag may nag-arrest bigla the CPR team initially goes there runs and rushes to try to do the CPR but as people begin to learn that these are very futile efforts they become to care less and less so this is what we call compassion fatigue and it's not very good because um, you have less job satisfaction related with, you know, com having compassion fatigue. So, in, in general, pandemics can be stressful, okay? Um, it, it, we, we've all experienced this, uh, and I think everybody knows that, that um, stress is, has a lot of uh, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, and mental symptoms. Um, that can lead to the following. So we've already mentioned them. Uh, and the, the worst thing about the stress is that you can even have uh, exacerbation of existing health problems like hypertension, you know, or if you have existing mental health issues, um, it can be exacerbated. And there's also an increase in the use of tobacco, alcohol, and other substances, including um, gadget addiction among kids, among your peers. Nakikita nyo na addict na sila sa, sa mga gadgets. No? How you respond to stress during the pandemic can depend on your background and your social support from the family and friends that you have, your financial situation, your health and emotional background, and the community you live in. So the changes that can happen during the pandemic and the ways we try to contain the spread of the virus has can affect everyone and 
hopefully uh, we tr this talk will try to make us understand that stress is a fact of life but it doesn't have to be our way of life so what can we do about it what physicians and nurses and frontliners can do to address mental and behavioral health care needs within our realm of practice so we need to first change our focus. There's no easy fix for recovering from depression or finding the energy and motivation to take the first step. Um, and it's very tough to take that first step. But w what you have more control over your mood, um, uh, but you have more control over your mood than you may realize. Uh, it's true that these are painful and worrying times and few people have much to be cheerful about during the moment. But at the same time, depression can make things even seem more worse than they actually are. So when you're depressed, everything is filtered, filtered through a lens of negativity. And by simply recognizing that, you can start to change your focus and make the first step to feeling more optimistic so when you're depressed out of work or or you're overwork and you're isolated from your friends or your social network uh, negative thoughts begin to run over and over in your head and can seem never-ending but you can break the cycle by focusing on something that adds meaning and purpose to your life and perhaps there's something you've always uh, wanted to learn like a new language or a musical instrument then you can probably use those things to distract yourself like for example a lot of um, uh, doctors that i know um, uh, yung practice nila na affectohan during the pandemic so what they did was they took the time to take their masters and take advantage of the online platforms uh, during the pandemic so now that it's becoming new normal a bunch of them you can see them in facebook a bunch of your friends uh, my friends have already graduated from this um, 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 online uh, master's program so those things you can do in order to distract yourself. Some people have become plantitos, diba? Or plantitas. And a lot of them have, have tried to learn some form of um, musical instruments using apps that are available. And while you can't force yourself to have fun, you can at least push yourself to do things that will boost your mood. So you can try to listen to music or push things to do uh, things that will make you happy, right? Like watching a, a, a favorite sitcom or se spending time in nature or solitary walks or just get a friend who you know to be very close to you or somebody you can confide in and then you can spend time going out or try to play with your kids or your pet. Now, this Netflix, uh, YouTube, HBO, you can take um, advantage of those things but not too much you know because you can also get addicted to these things right so yes you want to stay informed during the pandemic but over consuming uh, news uh, from unreliable social media coverage will only fuel your negativity and fear so we have to limit how often we check the news or social media and confine confine ourselves to reputable sources like lately you can see diba there's a lot of news that's saying na baka mag lockdown ulit like especially in manila uh, we're already in alert level one so they they're thinking about you know the surge again so people are beginning to panic and worry and and it's not very good so just confine yourself to reputable sources and sleeping too much or too little, skipping meals or exercise, and neglecting your personal care only feeds into your depression or your mental health issues. So establishing and maintaining a daily routine, on the other hand, adds structure to your day, even if you're alone and out of work or, or even when you're just resting or you're off duty so try to include set, set times for exercising or spending time outside and communicating with friends each day and of course uh shepre when you're depressed it's really uh gonna feel like everything in life is hopeless or at least meaningless and bleak but even in the darkest darkest of days it's usually possible to find one thing you can be grateful about so um, you can 
keep a journal or a scratch paper or a drawer that contains all the things or small notes that you can write uh, little pieces of words that you are thankful for and then um, that might sound cheesy but acknowledging your gratitude can provide respite from the negative thinking and really actually boost your mood as well so you can actually have so many reasons to be grateful for uh, number one is being able to be alive i guess to to survive the pandemic that's one way of looking at it and of course we have to find new ways to engage with other friends or, or others uh, meeting friends and family in person is still not that um, um, easy for a lot of us you know because we're not really practicing social distancing but our work uh, there's what we call the re-entry anxiety where work is becoming difficult right now uh, because uh, we are slowly returning to normal diba? so now we're sp expending time to to do face-to-face -face conf um, uh, conferences doing a lot of paperwork patients are rushing into the hospitals again so dumadami na ulit yung work and and it's it it, it precludes uh, the ability for us to just go out during our off time and meet with with our friends okay so we can find new ways on how to connect with them uh, we and how to connect with these people who mean a lot to us we need to move beyond small talk to really establish a connection that will ease your loneliness and your depression and you need to take a risk uh, by opening up and sticking to small talk and limiting yourself to surface connection like texting lang diba will actually make you feel lonelier in that um you know very superficial and shallow so you also need to open up about what you're going through uh, because people know that pe other people are are or can be experiencing the same problems and sometimes diba, you expect people to know how you're feeling but they don't and especially in in urology i'm sure majority will be males and males aren't really used to uh, open up their feelings eh, with with other people so uh, it takes time and uh, just finding out sa mga lalaki just finding out how your friend is doing just kamustahan lang that will already um, at least open the doors for you guys any of you uh, can can make you open up to those people and of course remember that nothing needs to get fixed uh, depression release co relief comes from making a connection and being heard by someone the person you talk to does not really need to come up with solution they just need to be listening to you without judging or criticizing and the same is true when you listen to them as well so get creative you know uh, if you normally don't engage with video calls, um, try to experiment, do some virtual face-to-face -face interactions or play an online game. Um, like, like previously, we had this uh, e-bingo, you know. So, so, sa mga iba naman, inuman, di ba? So, those are new ways to connect with friends who are far away right and your daily habits can also play a big role in helping you overcome these mental health issues during the health crisis uh, it's tempting to slip um, uh, slip into bad habits especially during the pandemic diba? Um, uh, you may be stuck at home or not be able to go to work or you're just down and you just want to eat and eat um, very unhealthy foods you may sleep irregular hours you know uh, not just because it's related to your work, but also because you can't sleep. So you can try to get out of that uh, cycle by adopting healthier daily routines that can boost your mood, uh, make you feel energized, and relieve uh, symptoms of depression. So try to get moving. So exercising is one of the last things you would like to do when you're depressed or you're down. But it's also one of the most effective ways to boost your mood. So in fact, uh, regular exercise can be just as effective as an antidepressant medication. So even if you're still um, uh, in the downer mood, uh, there are creative ways to fit movement into your daily routine. You can also practice um 
uh, relaxation techniques, uh, try to meditate or do the breathing in and out. Uh, uh, most of your uh, uh, watches now will have the parang 10 seconds breathing in and out and it really helps relax people especially if you're having anxiety as well and of course as we said eat mood boosting diets uh, it's easy to for us to uh, to get fast food or comfort foods uh, packed with unhealthy fats sugar and refined carbs but um, if we focus on fresh and wholesome foods, we are able to take advantage of mood-enhancing nutrients such as your omega-3 uh, fatty acids. Okay, so again, infusing even 5 to 10 minutes stretch breaks, especially kayo when you do surgery, it's quite a stressful, uh, physically stressful and mentally stressful job. And after work, you just want to lie down, di ba? But infusing exercise in your routine can increase your productivity and also your creativity. You can include a favorite song, you know, to, to infuse your day with. Um, energy and then of course we need to sleep well and use reminders to keep yourself on track okay so how do we deal with negativity or anxiety kasi mabilis sabihin or oh, depressed malungkot tayo and but 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 majority or more often we're just really caught up in a cloud of negativity and anxiety or excessive overthinking or worry diba so Hopefully, the next few slides will be able to help us deal with um, um, of that. Alright, so the first step in managing distressing thoughts is to notice and acknowledge those thoughts. Accept that you are feeling bad or feeling not well or feeling nervous or worried. When you feel anxious, ask yourself, what am I afraid of or worried about at this particular moment? And then, you need to challenge those thoughts. For example, remind yourself that just because somebody around you is coughing doesn't mean, di ba, may COVID sila kaagad, right? Or um, uh, sometimes you feel na pinagsabihan ka, tapos may nag-uusap dun sa isang tabi, feeling mo kaagad pinkaw, ikaw yung pinag-uusapan. So you get a little bit um, um, distressed about it. Right? So many times we tend to respond to anxiety-driven thoughts by seeking out evidence su supporting those thoughts. So we have confirmation bias. But um, this confirmation bias allows us to ignore the facts diba? or in ignore the evidence to the contrary so that we are stuck or we get stuck to overthinking the negative parts. And for example, when you catch yourself... Um, um, thinking um, of uh, these negativities, consider reframing your thoughts to focus on the positive. So this is in contrast with toxic positivity. Ah, kasi meron word na toxic positivity where reality-based uh, thinking is for, for gone and you keep on saying, oh, look at the bright side, let's be positive, let's be positive when, when in fact, uh, there's nothing to be positive about. So, the, refraining your thoughts is quite different from toxic positivity. So, how do we re reframe irrational thinking? For example, uh, irrational thinking would be, I can't do this. Uh, this is the worst thing ever. And sometimes we distort it. Uh, the, the, the distortion type is like, uh, it's catastrophic thinking. We can actually reframe it by saying to ourselves that this situation is re really difficult, but I will get through it. Alright, so if you notice that cognitive restructuring means not really going out of the reality, okay, of the situation. The situation is really bad, but you, you just reframe your thoughts so that you make this situation a little bit more acceptable. Okay, so again, uh, another example is if this isn't perfect, then it's a complete failure. So this is what we call the all or nothing thinking. But if we reframe our thoughts, then we can say that perfect is unre unrealistic. Giving it my best shot or all the, uh, giving it my all is what matters. So that becomes a, a bit more um, acceptable. So or sometimes when we say, oh, that doesn't count. It was total luck. Okay, so this is disqualif disqualifying positive thinking. And what you can do to reframe is, is to 
to think about the positive side, which is I work really hard for it and then I am proud of myself. So again, this is a simplified way to deal with negative thoughts. First is to recognize and accept that you have those negative thoughts and then identify the particular feeling or situation where by you have had those um, uh, develop those anxiety or negativity and then challenge them look for evidence to really refute or prove those thoughts and then try refraining your thoughts so remember that feelings are feelings and therefore they are changeable and if you watch Enola Holmes uh, you can see that that uh, Sher Sherlock Holmes actually said you're being emotional it's understandable but definitely unnecessary and Enola Holmes looking at refraining her thoughts to say that but I now see that being alone doesn't mean I need to be lonely okay so focus on what you can control channel your energy uh, only to those things that are within your power Okay, so if you have done all you can and the un or the answer is nothing, then consider re res redirecting your attention to topics or concerns over which you can exert more control. And you can also find ways to ground yourself to the present moment and do a five sense check. So what are the five senses? You can try to to close your eyes, you know, to 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 feel. All right, to hear, to smell, to to really realize and be more aware of your breathing, your heartbeat, and and that is how we practice uh, mindfulness and being in the present. Okay, so some of you are listening to this talk and probably already texting or thinking about your OR later on, or your clinic, or your family later on, or what you have to do later on. So without being uh, present, right? So it, it's quite difficult to be present, and you need to practice. You need to put conscious effort on being mindful of what you do. So you need to take action through value-driven behaviors and. This means do what is important to you. Do what you value. So if you greatly value family, then find some creative ways to connect to those people. Like for example, having dinner or having lunches together. Uh, have a sacred protected, protected time with your family without the cell phones, for example. Right? So that can also help uh, deal with the stress. And of course, we need to disconnect. And disconnecting from our gadgets from time to time will help you be more creative and less distracted and more focused on what is essential and what really is uh, important and of course we know that we're a lot a lot of our bosses a lot of the institutions have posted a lot of demands uh, from us because of the pandemic so that more of us are uh, being you know, overwork and most of our bosses are demanding so much from us as well. So uh, we need to have recovery and to understand that more time working does not equal more productivity. So in management courses, you will see the law of diminishing re return, whereby there's only a certain point where you work really hard, you put a lot of input, and then you become more productive, but only up to a certain limit. Because uh, when you keep working, working, working more, then you have diminishing returns. And in fact, they can have negative returns later on. Why? Because you have an opportunity cost that you you forego, for example, or if you choose one thing to do one thing, not the other, right? So overworking does not really mean being more productive. So BC does not equal productive. So learn to use whatever time you have to get more of the right stuff or the essential stuff uh, done. And of course, we need to recover and stay away from AIDS. So AIDS is not HIV. Uh, it's just my acronym to say, uh, to, to, to define people who act busy all the time. So AIDS stands for as if doing something, right? So stay away from having AIDS. All right, to reiterate, um, what physicians can do to address mental and behavioral health care needs within their 
practice is first is to take care of yourself first. So you know that when we ride airlines, diba, we, we are often reminded that we need to put on our own oxygen mask first before helping others in an event of emergency. Attending to your mental health and social well-being, uh, psychosocial well-being first before caring for others is as important. Okay, so it's the primary step. And then uh, first is how do we take care of ourselves is to feel free to feel those feelings um, you and everybody else around us in the medical field are likely to feel immense pressure given the potential surges again and in care demands risk of infection and equipment shortages among other stressors from this pandemic so experiencing stress and the feelings associated with it are by no means a sign of weakness and a reflection on your ability to do your job. So intentionally employ coping strategies. Uh, you need to put into practice those that we mentioned already, those things that can relieve you of your stress, which includes probably exercise, uh, rest, and eating healthy. And then you need to monitor yourself for symptoms of depression and stress, uh, such as prolonged sadness, difficulty sleeping, intrusive memories and or feelings of hopelessness you need to talk to a trusted colleague or supervisor be open to seeking professional help if symptoms persist or worsen over time and you need to take breaks from news you know only looking at um, um, reputable sources okay so try to uh, uh, break the habit of looking at your computer or your smartphone um, uh, every Okay, so be fortified by remembering the importance and meaning of your work. Remind yourself that as doctors and frontliners, nurses, that despite the current challenges and frustrations, yours is a noble calling. Ours is a noble co calling. Taking care of those in need in a time of uncertainty. And make sure to recognize also the efforts and sacrifices made by your colleagues. Okay, and then of course, Take care of your staff because your ta staff takes care of you when they're taken care of, diba? So you can adjust staffing, staffing procedures. You can, uh, if you're in the admin position or in the uh, higher position that you have um, uh, colleagues who are under you, then you can rotate workers, rotate duties, and um, uh, partner workers, diba? Uh, partner good people together, those people who work well together, don't partner those who hate each other, diba? So, <laughs> medyo, you need to take care of those. And then, of course, implement a flexible working schedule and provide the staff uh, a means to access um, psychological support, alright? Make this a priority, not just their uh, infection risk or their physical safety. And of course, regularly and supportively monitor well-being of your staff, okay? And uh, um, be ready to identify risk and emerging issues and adaptively respond to their needs. And co create an environment of open communication where you can encourage everybody or the staff to open openly um, discuss their concern and provide brief and regular forums to update staff on the status of the practice or how the management is addressing challenges and provide mechanisms for the staff to express their concerns ask questions and encourage peer support among colleagues and for individual concerns uh, related to one's mental health and well-being, encourage communication with trusted colleagues in addition to accessing your uh, employee assistance program. And of course, when we take care of ourselves, our staffs, eventually you also need to be able to take care of your patients, especially that knowing that health, mental health issues not only affect us frontliners but also our patients right so you need to establish a system to identify and provide care for mental health conditions um, apart from the medical or urological conditions that your patients are suffering from and of course you need to facilitate additional training for frontline staff um, uh, when your time or resources can permit um, they should have at least training on basic psychological care principles and psychological uh, first aid to be able to provide for patients. Uh, online training 
may be used um, to train this uh, patient, uh, this, this um, staff. Okay. And of course, we need to verify referral pathways so that if you have patients with mental health issues or psychiatric dis distress, you know who to call or who to refer these patients to. Um, I'm not sure if your institutions will have uh, psychiatry departments that you can refer to, but, but find out about those things uh, and then uh, verify those referral pathways and provide clear, understandable communication among patients. So if they understand English, you use English. If you, they only understand Tagalog or your local dialects, then try to use and take advantage of those. And of course, incorporate those guidance about stress into general practice. So emotional distress and anxiety is common to everybody. So it's important that we need to help these patients acknowledge stress and help normalize it and if all else doesn't seem to work try to seek professional help and if everything fails then you can smile right so uh, thank you very much again for this opportunity um, I, I thank you for your kind attention with that I end my talk thank you
Miss Donna Jane de Calos da Hios RN is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Nursing at San Pedro College, Davao and Master of Arts in Nursing at Davao Doctors College. She is a member of the Urologic Nurses Association of the Philippines, Philippine Nurses Association and a volunteer of Smile Asia and World Surgical Foundation. She was the past president of the Operating Room Nurses Association of the Philippines, ORNAP, Davao Chapter. She has clinical expertise in surgical instrumentation including endoscopic instruments. She is an expert in operating room, central processing and minimally invasive surgery suite practices, procedures and protocols. She also has vast knowledge and experience in perioperative nursing standards and infection control standards. Good day to everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Philippine Urologic Association Mindanao Chapter for the success of this postgraduate course webinar spearheaded by Dr. Paul Nimrod Ferreza and the president of the PUA Mindanao Chapter, Dr. Ricardo Halipa. It's an honor to be one of the speakers in this webinar entitled Urology Practice Hack 3.0 Multidisciplinary Outlook in Urology. Again, I am Donna Jane Dajalos Dayos, a former OR nurse in minimally invasive surgery from Southern Philippines Medical Center. I will be discussing to you the pre, intra, post operative urologic nursing care. And to begin with, today I will be talking about the three phases of the peer perioperative period, and the different role and responsibilities of nurses in each perioperative phase. Perioperative nursing connotes the delivery of patient care during the surgical experience through the framework of nursing process. This includes three phases, and the first is the preoperative phase. This begins when the surgical decision is made and end when the patient is transferred to operating room, while intraoperative is the period of time spent in the operating room. Lastly, postoperative phase is from the admission of the patient to post-anesthetic care unit or recovery until follow-up care. According to American Urologic Association, Preoperative are medical evaluation or treatment received in preparation prior to a urologic surgery or procedure. Urologic patients undergoing operative procedures require thorough preoperative assessment and planning prior to intervention. Failure to properly assess the preoperative needs of this patient can potentially result to increased intraoperative or postoperative morbidity. For example, in 2011, a retrospective study was done across 25 hospitals and found that approximately 8% of elective urologic surgery were canceled within 24 hours of the scheduled procedure and needed to be rescheduled. Incomplete medical workup was cited as a significant source for many of the cancellations. Then what covers preoperative nursing? Nursing responsibilities during this phase include ensuring that informed consent is obtained, preoperative assessment, which includes gathering of medical history and physical assessment. Next is facilitating medical evaluation and providing preoperative ed education. During obtaining of informed consent, we know that informed consent is a legal and ethical process designed to protect the patient by promoting decision and voluntary authorization for treatment or surgical procedure. The process is based on three tenets, includes precondition, information, and consent. Under precondition, this includes competence and voluntariness of the patient. This means that the patient decision is made without pressure or coercion. Information elements represent the disclosure of information, recommendation of a care plan, and the patient understanding of the proposed procedure. In here, possible complications are also discussed in the nature of treatment patient will undergo. 
Lastly, consent includes the patient's decision and authorization in which signature is obtained with a patient complete understanding of what to occur. Any absence among the three will make the informed consent null and void. However, there are situ situations that require special form of consent and also it depends on any institution or the hospital policy. Situations under special form of consent includes obtaining consent for minor or child, um, patient undergoing surgery below 18 years of age, also emergency or urgent cases where the patient can't consent, and safeguarding for people with mental health issues. The next responsibility is obtaining preoperative assessment. Establishing baseline evaluation is very vital, so it is done by carrying out preoperative interview. All of the following information must be obtained during preoperative assessment. The first is obtaining demographic data, so um, age gender, and patient location is also um, taken. Chief complaint. Patient urologic chief complaint to be addressed by the intervention is noted or the reason why the patient needs to undergo with the procedure. The next one is history of present illness. This describes the patient's symptoms and physical signs related to the underlying urologic condition and also note the duration, severity, and location of each. Laterality, if applicable, must be stated under this area. Also, past medical and surgical history is obtained. So previous any previous urologic intervention, diagnostic testing, and imaging relevant to the present condition can be added in this segment. Also, a multi-system evaluation review of all the system will help identify any active issues in major organ systems prior to surgery. Next is an updated medication list, which includes active medication, the dosage, delivery, and frequency. This also needs to prevent any drug-to-drug -drug interaction during the surgery, or if the patient is taking any blood thinners, antihypertensive, or any hyperglycemic agents. Nutritional supplements are also do documented in this area. Social history. So under social history is if the patient has an history of smoking, alcohol, or drug usage, this includes the duration of use are recorded. A description also of the person's jobs activities that may impact surgery or recovery are also helpful to describe. And lastly, a physical examination or a general physical exam should include major organ system if relevant to upcoming surgery. So here, this is an example of perioperative form. So you can see demogra the demographic data are taking, taken. The next is the um, chief complaint or, or the preoperative diagno diagnosis. The next is um, the history of the present illness. Also, um, past medical and surgical history is also here. And the review of all the systems, patients' significant medication, social um, history, or if the patient is smoker or alcoholic, and the physical exam must be assessed under preoperative assessment. The next one is facilitating medical evaluation. A recent study found that the patient undergoing non-cardiac surgery have a 3% risk of major cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. Also, pulmonary complications are a significant source of morbidity and mortality in surgical patients and occur in up to 6% of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery, with up to 25% of the patient dying as a result of postoperative respiratory failure. Nursing responsibility under this includes facilitating medical evaluation through collaborating and carry, carrying out medical assessment or medical orders, diagnostic, which will clarify the risk and attempt 
to mitigate the risk of any complication. This assessment may reveal an undiagnosed condition that will help the patient and the urolo urologist better understand the risk and benefit of the surgery and may influence the optimal timing of the surgery. So medical evaluation focus, but not limited to cardiovascular and pulmonary function, renal, endocrine, gastro, or hematologic function. Lastly, under preoperative phase, one of the responsibility is providing or um, giving the patient preoperative education. Counseling and education are very vital component of preoperative preparation, care, and the informed consent process. The content of preoperative education focuses on the information that will increase patient familiarity with the procedural event. Thus, this will help decrease patient anxiety towards the su surgery or the procedure. Pre-op education is also a team approach. So this includes, but not limited to, urologists, any advanced practice providers or nurses, and even radiographers. So frequently, both of them or all of them work together to educate patients throughout preoperative assessment. Also, tailored education should accompany specific treatment or procedures. So for example, stoma marking and ostomy care education precedes cystectomy and ileal conduit or any urinary diversion creation. Also, antiviral medication precedes any renal transplant surgery. Bladder irrigation for patient undergoing CISTO-TURBT or CISTO-TURP. And urinary catheter care or any bladder training management precedes prostatectomy. So we know that evaluation of understanding is a vital component of patient education. How can you evaluate the effectiveness of preoperative education? So teach back or repeat back is a tool that allow patient to reiterate in their own word what they understood about the content. This has been shown to have a positive effect on the patient comprehension. Also, documentation of teaching uh, helps the surgical team refer back to previous education and address any knowledge gaps. Moving on, intraoperative phase happened when that time um, the client is admitted to the OR to the time of anesthesia administration performance of the surgical procedure and until the patient is transported to recovery room. Aside from the basic role as scrub nurses and circulating nurses, role and responsibilities under this space are as follow. The first one is promoting a culture of safety. Ineffective team communication in the OR is one of the most important causes of medical errors. So communication failures during surgery occur in approximately 30% of team exchanges and a third of these jeopardizes patient safety by increasing cognitive load, interrupting routine, and increasing tension in the OR. Surgeons, nurses, pharmacists, and even technicians and other healthcare professionals must coordinate with activities to ensure patient care is safe and efficient. Communication and teamwork are critical for delivering safety and quality care. Processes such as huddles, um, preoperative briefings, and pre-procedural timeouts, or also known as surgical pause, are designed to improve safety and coordination through enhanced communication. These discussions occur at the beginning of the surgical day and prior to the induction of anesthesia and may include surgical team introductions, articulation of key positioning, surgical step, medication, or coordination requirements. Studies indicate that preoperative huddles reduce disruptions, improve OR flows, and increase um, surgeon satisfaction. So the following practices help familiarization among the surgical team, thus promoting smooth flow of the procedure. 
The next nursing responsibility is preventing surgical infection. So under this are um, giving antibiotic prophylaxis, hair removal, skin antisepsis, surgical hand scrub, and maintaining sterility. So antibiotic prophylaxis is an important element of surgical site infection and should be a part of the checklist reviewed during timeout. So most antibiotics should be administered within an hour proceeding to the procedure. However, um, there are antibiotics such as vancomycin, um, fluoroquinolones that needs to infuse slowly. So this, this should be initiated up to two hours prior to the procedure. Also, a single dose or less than 24 hours of antibiotic for routine post-operative prophylaxis is recommended. So single dose antimicrobial prophylaxis is appropriate in the majority of uncomplicated urologic cases. So there are guidelines that can help um, procedure-specific antibiotics, but surgeon also uh, must adjust for local antibiotic resistance as well as the weight, um, kidney, and liver function of the patient. So factors to consider. So the potential benefit of antimicrobial prophylax prophylaxis um, should be considered with assessment of five points. So the first is the patient ability to respond to an infection. So patients who are immunocompromised or patients who have who has co comorbidities like diabetes. Also, um, the procedure being performed, so the longer the duration of the surgery, the higher the risk of patient having an infection. Also, the next one is procedural factors that increase the likelihood of bacterial invasion at the operative site. Site. So um, also the site, the size of the surgical site must be taken into consideration and also if the patient will receive an implants or alike. The next one is the virulence of the bacterial pathogens and lastly the potential morbidity of any subsequent infection. The next one is hair removal. So histori historically, um, hair at the surgical site um, is being removed prior to incision. However, this practice has been challenged due to lack of evidence that it prevents surgical site infection, coupled with concern regarding increased risk of SSI, so specifically when razors are used. So when razors are used, microtrauma from shaving is assumed to provide a portal of entry for microbes, thus increasing the risk of SSI. So the key points for this one is leave the hair in place if it does not interfere with surgery. And the next one is if non-scrotal hair removal is required, clip rather than shave. So the SHA, uh, Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America, or SHEA, released a guidelines last 2014 that razors are acceptable for scrotal skin consistent with a small study of your urology patient, which found that clipping can cause greater damage to scrotal skin than razor. The next one is skin antisepsis. So alcohol-based products seem to exhibit superior efficacy compared to their aqueous counterparts. So the American College of Surgeons recommends that alcohol-based preparation to be used unless contraindicated. Also, allow prep to dry completely to provide both optimal efficacy and prevents fire. So, extra consideration should be given to the pubic hair area where commonly used alcohol-based antisepsis may take to an hour to dry if the hair is left in place. And also, placement of drip towels alongside the patient is very important to prevent pooling of the solution which can cause skin irritation chemical burns, or even um, provide fuel for surgical fires. Keynotes, just keynote for this one is if there's um, without mucous membrane involvement, so you can use alcohol-based prep. Uh, however, if there are mucous membrane involvement, mucous membrane, um, this includes stoma or genitals, so um, aqueous iodine-based prep must be used. The next one is surgical hand scrubbing. So recent um, systematic review showed that 
Waterless chlorhexidine scrubs appear to be an effective as water-based scrubs, so this will just only take less time and reduce bacterial load compared to povidone iodine scrub. The next is prevention of wrong site and wrong procedure surgery has been, ident has been identified as a priority by numerous organizations, including WHO. So wrong site surgery is rare with estimate uh, for various procedures ranging from 1 in 4,200 incident of wrong site ureteral stent. And a systematic review estimated that the overall rate was 1 to 5 per 10,000 procedure, according to American Urologic Association. So nursing responsibility includes ensuring that surgical site is marked prior to transport of the patient to the OR. So just key note for these uh, key points for this one are um, surgical site marking is carried out after all the in available information concerning the patient's identity, the procedure, and the surgical site intended site. So um, it must be provided by the patient's medical file, notes, imaging, the consent uh, has been checked and cross-referenced. So surgical site marking should be done by the person who will perform the procedure or by a qualified designing and should be made um, before the patient is moved to OR. Also, it should be involved only the operative site and should be visible before the patient is draped. Also, the mark is made using a permanent skin marker sufficient such that the mark is still visible after skin preparation. Also, during timeout, timeout should occur before incision involve the entire ORT. Also, during timeout, um, confirmation of laterality must be done. So, and lastly, an X is not used for site marking. So, the mark should uh, be an ambiguous. And also, maintaining sterility. So scrub nurse is trans responsible in assisting the surgeon and surgical assistant during the procedure and anticipate the instruments and surgical equipment required. So um, scrub nurses uh, are responsible in setting up the sterile field and it, mu uh, it must be put into consideration the uh, equipment um, needed in the procedure. While the circulating nurses uh, are responsible for managing all nursing care within the operating room, observing the surgical team from a broad perspective, and assisting the team to create a man and maintain a safe, comfortable environment for patient surgery. So this also includes setting up the um, operating theater. The next is preventing falls or positioning injuries. Patient positioning is possibly one um, of the most critical components of any surgical procedure. So um, while under, the patient is under anesthesia, the patient is, patient is completely dependent upon the surgical team to prevent injury while obtaining adequate surgical and anesthetic access. So we will discuss the supine position. Um, supine position is the most frequent use position for surgery. So in this, um, the patient is in reclining position uh, with a face up. So this position is indicated most commonly following abdominal pelvic surgery or laparoscopic surgery. So also for hernia, scrotal exploration, and even supine PCNL. So in supine position, the following must be taken into consideration. So head should remain in neutral position with appropriate padding. Also, to prevent brachial plexus injury, arm should not be extended beyond 90 degrees from the torso and should remain parallel with the floor on padding that is level with the table and with the head, hands supinated. Also, top arm should position with the palm facing the thighs. So, and with adequate padding of the ulnar, ulnar nerves. The next one is lithotomy position. So lithotomy position is carried commonly during cystoscopic procedures. And the patient can be placed in either the boot style leg holder. Um, some 
it's like a yellow thin or um, the ordinary, which is the syrup style position. So for the lithotomy position, ensure that the stirrups are even and also avoid compression injury to the perineal nerve by preventing pressure to the nerve where it crosses the lateral head of the fibula. And elevate the leg slowly and simultaneously, limiting external rotation of the hips. So in flank position, um, perioperative nurses must ensure first that the OR table can, break, can be break or can be manipulated to promote better exposure of the flank area. So <clears throat> key points for this one is the hips and shoulder must be rolled as a unit, unit to avoid spinal torsion. Also, the upper leg remains straight and is supported by a pillow between thighs. And this one, an axillary ro roll is placed several inches caudal to the axilla to prevent brachial compression injury. With a properly placed axillar axillary roll, a hand can easily place in the axilla, which has been lifted off the bed. So um, also, you need bolster for this one and strap for the patient to prevent from falling. So... The next one is prone position. So the prone position requires um, chest, bo uh, chest bolster, either extending, extending from the clavicle to the iliac crest on each side of extending or extending horizontally across the chest and iliac crest to permit normal chest wall movement and minimize abdominal pressure. So picture at the top, this one. Um, it is a special bolster um, to promote uh, or permit normal chest wall movement and minimize abdominal pressure. Also, attention should be given to the breast and male genitalia uh, and a specialized headboard that will facilitate access to the airway with protective padding to the forehead, eyes, and chin while ensuring the eyes are free from any pressure. So this one. The next one is preventing excessive radiation exposure. So we know um, that um, urologic procedure uses C-arm or x-rays. So key points, some key point for this one is the most important way to minimize radiation is to use the lowest possible setting and minimize exposure time. Also, protective equipment, um, lead gown, should be routinely worn by surgical team members. And also there are surgical badge that um, can uh, measure the amount of uh, amount or the exposure of the radiation your, your radiation. So also having a dedicated radiation technologies can potentially reduce time since such individuals are familiar with the case anatomy. So The next is preventing operating room fires and laser injuries. Over the four decades, so laser and energy devices has become a, become a mainstay of urologic surgery. So laser safety in urologic procedures is based on the type of laser use, mode of the operation, power density, tissue response, instrumentation, and, and risk. So also intraoperative fires are uncommon events in urologic surgery. So um, just some of the takeaway points in preventing OR fires and laser injury includes, so as what we've uh, discussed earlier, um, allowing alcohol-based prep to dry completely before beginning of the case. Also, reholstering electrocautery pencil between uses and the placing fiber optic light sources in standby mode when it is not in use. So, for example, for this picture, um, the optical light um, can cause burn on drapes or even can cause um, burn into patient. So, the next one is preventing venous thromboembolism or VTE. So, your logic surgery often increases the risk of venous thromboembolism, such as 
uh, DVT or the deep ven venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. So the nursing rule is to ensure that patient must wear compressed stockings. This is an uh, example of TED stockings or the patient must be attached to an intermittent compression devices. So um, this is an example of a Clotron. So the next is improving surgeon and assistant ergonomics. So the physical setup of the OR has important implication for surgeon ergonomics, including table height, video monitor placement, and pedal placement. So optimal table height also adjustment minimizes the strain of the upper limb uh, and upper back of the surgeon. So musculoskeletal injury is prevalent among surgeons conducting open laparoscopic and robot robotic surgery and is related to isometric contraction, posture, and monitoring positioning. So optimizing ergonomic is in the operating room has a direct health benefit also to the surgeon. So uh, in this image, the surgeon on the left side, uh, the left is standing with a correct posture. Can you see the um, posture? So uh, with head only slightly inclined, approximately 20 degrees, and the surgeon on the right has incorrect posture with his back and head overly flexed. So in open surgery, the recommended height of the table is 5 centimeters below the level of the tallest surgeon's elbow with the sur shorter surgeon standing on stool or compens compensate to compensate. So this is for the open procedure. While in contrast for laparoscopic procedure, laparoscopic table height should be lower than open surgery. So ideally, having the surgeon's elbow, elbow flexed 90 to 120 degrees to avoid shoulder and wrist injury associated with tables at open surgery height. So as a, as a guide, the table should be situated approximately 70 to 80 percent of elbow height or roughly the level of the operating surgeon's pubic bone. So um, the operating table in laparoscopic surgery is slightly lower compared to open surgery. Also, proper monitor placement in the OR is shown with great uh, with a straight line between the surgeon and assistant body orientation, target organs, and monitor, as shown in the in the second image. So with this one, um, recommended viewing distance is three feet away in order to optimize visual acuity and prevent further protrusion of the neck in order to see clearly. So correct monitor height is shown in the top image. The top of the monitor is placed at the eye level and approximately three feet away from the surgeon. And the other one, incorrect monitor height with the monitor above eye level is shown in the bottom image so this is the right and the wrong so nursing responsibility includes ensuring that the operating theater complex is already prepared and set up prior to surgery so this involves gathering the needed instruments in each procedure um, ensuring that all the machines are fully functional and positioned in the right area Lastly, the post-operative phase. So this is the time the client is transferred to recovery room or post-anesthesia care unit to the moment the patient is transported back to the surgical unit or ward, discharged from the hospital until the follow-up care. So this diagram shows an example of OR nurse hand over to PACO nurse. So a call is then stating the, a brief procedure and pertinent data prior to transport to recovery room. And once the patient arrives, immediate um, safety is ensured through verifying stable vital signs through attachment to cardiac monitor and connecting patient to auto inhalation. Also, a structured handoff is being done and transfer of care is completed. Furthermore, nursing responsibility in this phase has an acronym of post-operative. So P 
which is preventing um, or relieving complications. So mo we know that most common complication during post-op is post-op pain, respiratory atelectasis, hemorrhage, and paralytic ileus. Also, optimal respiratory function. So encouraging patient with deep breathing can optimize respiratory function. So some of the nursing diagnosis um, of patient um, having surgery is ineffective airway clearance secondary to secretions or ineffective breathing pattern secondary to anesthetics effect. The next one is as for support of psychosocial well-being, NT for tissue perfusion and cardiovascular status maintenance. So we know that early symptoms of shocks shock or I mean shock or hemorrhage is called clammy extremities, decreased urine outputs, low capillary refill, hypotension, and tachycardia. So for the O is observing and maintaining adequate uh, fluid intake, P for promote, promoting adequate nutrition and elimination, E for encouraging activity and mobility within limits, R, renal function maintenance, and A, adequate fluid and electrolyte um, balance. So in here, monitor, just monitor intake and out, uh, output of the patient and record the amount of wound drainage. And T for thorough wound care for adequate wound healing, I for infection control, B for vigilant manifestation of anxiety and promoting ways of relieving it, and eliminating environmental hazard and promoting fine safety. So inspect by inspecting dressing routinely and reinforce them if necessarily. Also check dressing for constriction. And here is also keep side rails up until patient is fully awake and avoid ner nerve damage and muscle strain by properly supporting and padding pressure areas. Lastly, by understanding and applying the best practices for perioperative care, OR nurses, perioperative nurses, and uro urologists can optimize the quality of care for their urologic patient. And also remember, every day is a beautiful day to save lives. Thank you and keep safe.
Dr. Maria Pamela Pahati, she finished medicine at the University of Santo Tomas. She had her urology training at East Avenue Medical Center and became a diploma at last 2018. She pursued her two-year fellowship for pediatric urology at Philippine Children's Medical Center. Good afternoon, I am Maria Pamela Ipahati, and I'm here to discuss on managing pediatric urinary tract infections. So these are my references for today's lecture. And these are the objectives. We'll discuss the prevalence of pediatric urinary tract infection, the risk factors for developing UTI in this pediatric population, how to diagnose, to treat, and to monitor patients with UTI. Urinary tract infection in children is the most common bacterial infection in children. About 20% 20, 20 of pediatric patients consult because of fever. And amongst this pediatric population with fever, um, UTI is responsible for 7% of those patients. Incidence of UTI varies depending on age and sex. So here... Um, this this uh, table shows that the incidence of poor boys with UTI is highest during the first six months of life and decreases um, as they age, as compared with the female where UTIs are less common during the first uh, six months of life but increases with age. So why are we concerned um, of children having UTI. Um, it is because of your renal scarring. And we know that renal scarring can lead to long-term sequelae of hypertension and renal deterioration. So this was a study, there was a study done by his work and son, um, noting what happened to patients uh, or do they develop renal scarring or renal damage after um, UTI. Here, it showed that a lot or most of the children with febrile UTI actually do not develop renal damage. Only one-fifth or 20 out of 100 children will eventually develop renal damage. And these children um, who progress to renal damage are those children with recurrent febrile UTIs, especially those in combination with high-grade VUR. And we see that um, the risk of renal scarring increases with the number of febrile UTI the patient has. Um, here, um, when the patient had only one febrile UTI, you see that the risk of renal scarring is just 3%. And it increases to 30% after three or more febrile UTIs. So our goal in this pediatric patients is really to prevent renal scarring. And it is our goal to identify who among these children are at risk for recurrent febrile UTI. And in doing so, um, we have to have really have a high index of suspicions for UTI in the pediatric population, especially in infants and children less than two years old. No, the evaluation um, should include history and, and the importance of physical examination in pediatric patients cannot be overstated. So when we do our physical examination, these are the questions that we have to ask our patients. Is it the first time? or um, first time, or is, is it a secondary infection? Are there possible malformations of the urinary tract? Does the patient underwent any surgery about a family history or whether there is constipation or presence of lower urinary tract symptoms? So when you see pediatric patients, they're not really like the adult patients, especially in infants and units. Um, this age group is quite challenging, challenging um, when we make the diagnosis for UTI because symptoms in infants and neonates are very vague and very nonspecific. Symptoms such as poor appetite, failure to thrive, lethargy, irritability, vomiting, and diarrhea can also represent other diseases apart from UTI. Um, Toilet-trained children are 
they are more able to describe their symptoms and localize them to the urinary tract, such as they can complain if they have flank pain or suprapubic pain. Of course, physical examination um, is very important um, to do in pediatric population. And this includes examination of the abdominal area where you have to palpate whether there is tenderness, there's palpable mass. For the back and the spine, you see for external lesions such as dim dimpling, um, lipoma, hair tuft, or vascular mal malformation. For the genitalia, for boys, you have to inspect the urethral meatus if there's phimosis. You'd want to observe urinary stream for these patients. For those uh, female patients, you'd want to check if whether these patients with, with UTI has labial adhesions. And of course, you have to get um, the general, um, the general uh, physical examination of the patient their body weight, and their temperatures. So before administering any antibiotics for this patient, urine sample must be performed. So there are four methods of urine collections, and each collection, um, the more invasive the collection, the urine collection is, um, the less is the possible contamination. So when do we recommend or when do we advise um, proper urine collection? So for uh, plastic bag attached to the genitalia, we know that this is the least re reliable because contamination rate is very high, about 50 to 60%. It is only helpful when the culture results are negative or when the result of this plastic bag specimen is negative, then that's the only time that it is helpful. Otherwise, um, it is very non or least very non-reliable. For clean, clean catch urine collection, um, it showed good correlation of urine culture um, between collection with uh, clean catch urine and between your suprapubic aspiration. Um, it is recommended and can be done in older children, older girl, or, or, or in circumcised boys. Um, the contamination, though, is higher, about 26%, compared with catheterization of just 10% and SPA of 1%. Your transurethral bladder catheterization is the fastest and the safest method. Um, according to the AAP 2011, it is recommended collection uh, for young non-toilet trained children younger than two years of age. Although its disadvantage is it's being invasive. And of course, the most invasive, but the most sensitive method to obtain an uncontaminated urine sample is your suprapubic bladder aspiration. Um, we can also do a dipstick and microscopy for urinalysis sample. So your leukocyte esterate is a surrogate marker for pyuria. Your nitrite is your <laughs> specific for detecting bacteria. So your nitrate will be converted to your nitrite by most gram-negative enteric bacteria in the urine. So the use of this dipstick is that if the dipstick leukocyte and nitrites are both positive, then there is high positive predictive value for UTI. However, if it is both negative, um, there is high negative predictive value for UTI. So for microscopy, this is the standard method of assessing pyuria. So in the centrifuge urine, um, abnormal is more than 5 WBC per high power field. And it is very important to know, and it is essential for the diagnosis of UTI, is a positive urine culture. <clears throat> so how do we diagnose urinary tract infection? You, our, the urine is considered sterile. So if you're going to collect a suprapubic aspiration for your urine specimen, recovery of any organism is considered as um, urinary tract infection. 
for catheterized specimen, according to the American Association of uh, Pediatrics, 2011, the recovery of at least 50,000 colony forming units per ml is diagnosis of urinary tract infection. And if you're going to catch a uh, clean catch method for urine specimen, recovery of more than 100,000 colony forming units per ml is diagnosis of um, urinary tract infection. So now we know how to diagnose urinary tract infection. Now let's go to the risk factors. Who are the children that has higher risk factors for developing um, recurrent febrile uh, urinary tract infection? So as what I said um, the last um, in the few earlier slides, the only time that UTI are more prevalent in boys than in girls is at age younger than one year old. So we see here that 2.7 boys versus 0.7 girls uh, will have UTI in the first year of life. UTI occurs in all races, but they appear more uh, commonly in the Caucasian girls as compared with the other races. How about circumcision and UTI? Circumcision reduces the rate of UTI development in the first six months of life by almost tenfold. Uh, this is because um, uh, it is during the first six months of life where there is an increased amount of uropathogenic bacteria colonizing the prepuce. And this colonization appears to decrease and resolve by five years of age. So can we recommend doing circumcision for all um, newborn uh, kids. So there was a meta-analysis done by Singh Grewal where um, they identify that for normal healthy boys, they only have 0.5 to 1% risk of developing UTI. And you see that the re recurrence rates increase to 10% in patients with recurrent UTI and increased even more to 30% in patients with high-grade VUR. So in this study, they calculated that approximate, approximately 111 um, has to undergo circumcision in order to prevent one UTI in normal boys. And the, number, the needed number to treat decreases to 11 in recurrent UTIs patients and um, we need only four circumcision to be able to prevent uh, one UTI in high-grade VUR. So again, in patients with high-grade VUR and with recurrent UTI, um, it, is, uh, it is more recommended to do early circumcision as compared with uh, normal boys. And according to the AAP Task Force on Circumcision 2012, now, although health benefits are not great enough to recommend routine circumcision for all male newborns, the benefit of circumcision are sufficient to justify access to this procedure for families choosing it. And what are these benefits? The specific benefits identified included um, prevention of UTI, penal cancer, and transmission of some STIs. Okay. So... Other population in the pediatric um, population that are at high risk for recurrent UTI are those patients with neurogenic bladder. So the neurogenic detrusor sphincter dysfunction, your NDSD, can develop as a result of a lesion at any level of your nervous system. And this condition contributes to various forms of your LUTD, which can lead to UTIs, VR, and eventually to renal scarring. So a lot of patients with neurogenic bladder have normal upper tracts when they were born. But unfortunately, up to 60% will develop upper tract deterioration due to bladder changes, UTI, and or VR if not treated properly. So identification um, and prompt management for these patients is very important. So the goal of treatment you know, for patients with neurogenic bladder are to, of course, prevent urinary tract infection, prevent upper urinary tract deterioration, 
We want to achieve continence at an appropriate age. We want to promote good quality of life as possible. So starting these children, the patients with neurogenic bladder, on early intermittent catheterization um, greatly decreases the chance for renal complication and the need for later augmentation. So this is how we manage patients with neurogenic bladder. We start with intermittent catheterization with an anti-muscarinic medication. After that, these are the more invasive uh, management for those patients. And for those patients on CIC, a lot of them will have bacteria and or pyuria and are mostly asymptomatic. So 40 to 80% on CIC. Um, do we need antibiotic for these patients? Um, according to Ottolini et al., 1995, in patients without BUR, asymptomatic bacteria on CIC does not pose significant risk factor for renal damage and thus they do not require antibiotic therapy. So how do we do CIC? Do we have to do it sterile versus non-sterile? Can we use the tube single, single time or can we use it multiple times? Can we use lubricated or non-lubricated? So comparing um, catheters used in CIC showed no difference in reducing the risk in developing UTI. Another risk factor for pediatric uh, patients uh, in developing UTI is your vesicoureteral reflux. So your vesicoureteral reflux represents the retrograde flow of urine from the bladder to the upper urinary tract. Um, so we have the primary reflux and the secondary reflux. Your primary reflux, the main reason is that there is a fundamental deficiency in the function of your UVJ and the reflux mechanism. For your secondary reflux, your UVJ is overwhelmed no, by, 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 by problems other than deficiency in your UVJ. So before, so this is your international reflux grading system, uh, grading your vesicoureteral reflux into, into grades 1 to 5. So here, initially, they divided it into 1, 2, 3 as your low-grade VUR and your 4 and 5 into high-grade VUR. Um, but now a lot of studies are made and they now um, classify VURs into non-dilating VUR, which is your grades 1 and 2 VUR, and your dilating VUR, which are your 3, 4, and 5. Because your dilating VURs are the VURs that are, that are at higher risk of developing acute pyelonephritis and renal scarring. So what is the importance of VUR and UTI? Your VUR per se is not a cause of your UTI, but the presence of VUR with UTI facilitates pyelonephritis. So it facilitates um, going, of, going your, of your bacteria from your bladder, going to your kidney. And a lot of, so if you can see here, uh, not all of the patients who had history of acute pyelonephritis were, will eventually have scarring. It is only one-third or about 37% of children with history of acute pyelonephritis that will have renal scarring. And um, it has been shown that presence of your vesicoureteral reflux is a risk factor for renal scarring. And we don't want renal scarring for the reason that it can lead into long-term sequela of um, eventually renal deterioration, renal insufficiency, and hypertension. Um, so when do we perform VCUG? We know that VCUG um, is your diagnostic uh, of choice for your vesicoureteral reflux. According to the AAP guidelines, no, for 2 to 24 months with febrile UTI, 
um, they recommend doing a uh, um, voiding cystiurethrogram after the second febrile UTI and or if there is an abnormal finding in the renal bladder ultrasound. So once you have abnormality in your, once you have the reflux, you know, we, we want to know as to whether this patient already developed renal scarring. So the gold sta standard for identifying renal scars due to infection is your DMSA or your dimercaptosocenic acid renal, um, renal scan. But um, this detects irreversible renal damage, and this is done six months post presumed pyelonephritis. So you see that abnormal DMSA scans are more often seen with dilating VUR, and the likelihood of spontaneous resolution of VUR is less likely with an abnormal DMSA. Imp important to mention is another approach. So earlier we've discussed in order to diagnose your VUR, your vesicle ureteral reflux, we go first for the VCUG, which is your bladder, and if the patient has reflux, that's the time we do our um, DMSA to detect renal scarring. For the top-down approach, um, initial DMSA, DMSA scan um, is uh, requested first, and if it is normal, then no need to do your voiding system, your retrograde. However, if scarring is found on your DMSA scan, then uh, VCUG is recommended. So in patients with uh, normal DMSA with no VCUG, yes, we will fail to identify 5 to 27% of VUR. Although this VUR are said to be less significant, um, com uh, less significant. And in contrast, you know, if um, when we do the top-down approach, this would avoid unnecessary VCUGs in more than 50% of those that, that were screened with DMSA first. So we all we know that your vesicoureteral reflux has a tendency to resolve spontaneously, depending on the grade, depending on the age of the patient. So most of the patients with low grade, grades 1 and grade 2, will have resolution as high as 80 to 90%. And about 30 to 50% in patients with vesicoureteral reflux of grades 3 and 5 within the 4 to 5 years of age. That's why during this observation or during uh, while waiting for it to resolve, um, we can offer um, your antibiotics, your observation, or your surgery. And if with indication, we do the surgery. So what is the, um, the medical uh, management of patients with uh, vesicoureteral reflux? So you see here that, so your CAP is your continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. So you see here that it is clear that antibiotic prophylaxis may not be needed in all patients with reflux, no? Because trials show that benefit of your CAP or your continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is none or minimal in patients with low-grade reflux. So when do we um, recommend uh, giving your um, continuous antibiotic prophylaxis? So the continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is useful in patients with grade 3 and 4 uh, refluxes um, to prevent recurrent infection, um, but uh, its use in preventing further renal damage is not proven. So for toilet-trained children, uh, children with uh, recurrent UTI, with PBDs, with renal cortical abnormalities, these are the patients that would benefit from CAP. <clears throat> so... Um, this would decrease um, UTI in 50% of the time, but um, not the renal scarring and its consequences. For boys, toilet trained, um, even with high grades of VUR, but if the patient doesn't have BBD or recurrent 
febrile UTI or abnormality in your renal scan, then it your cap can be optional. So important for children with VUR of more than one year old, um, recommendation if the patient has BBD or bladder bowel dysfunction, you treat the BBD first you know, before doing any surgical intervention. So these are the choices um, for your antibiotic prophylaxis, your thimetoprim, sulfamethoxazole, your nitrofurantoin, and your first-generation cephalosporin. So these are the dosages. And when <clears throat> you will not give, at what age, um, these medications are not recommended to give. And when you have breakthrough infections, um, you have presence of scarring, multiple episodes of pyelonephritis, when you have persistent high grades, your grade 4 and grade 5, if you have intolerance of medical therapy, then surgical treatment of your vesicular ureteral reflux is um, recommended. Um, another risk factor that can cause recurrent UTI in children is your bladder bowel dysfunction. So... Um, your bladder bowel dysfunction is also very common in children, but most of them are unlikely or are, are uh, likely underdiagnosed in the pediatric population. So what happens here is that you have an increase in your fecal load that can affect the bladder emptying and storage. So in two ways. First is that because of uh, mechanical compression, so it compresses the bladder and hence decreasing the bladder capacity. And this decrease in bladder capacity, <clears throat> and, this de and this decrease in bladder capacity can cause urge incontinence and frequency. Another is that because of the increase in the rectal fluid, there is change in the physiologic neural stimuli of the bladder as well as the pelvic floor. And this could lead to progressively increase in the or decrease the urge in evacuation or can cause chronic bladder spasm, insufficient emptying, and significant post-void residual. Um, so relieving the child's issues, correcting the constipation of this patient can reduce um, urinary tract infection. <laughs> So summary of the summary of the diagnostic um, diagnostic tools in patients with with um, pediatric urinary tract infection. So your renal bladder ultrasound are non-invasive, relatively inexpensive, and safe in any age group, and it is the most common modality used to evaluate anatomic abnormalities, such as duplication, dilatation, and obstruction in the genital urinary tract system. For young children with a first UTI, RBUS is unlikely to alter clinical management, and it is not universally recommended. So your AAP guidelines as well as uh, your AAP guidelines recommend no, um, renal bladder ultrasound for children 2 to four, 24 months of age after their first febrile UTI. For nice guidelines for febrile UTI, they recommend, um, it is age-dependent, they recommend um, doing your renal bladder ultrasound after the first febrile UTI in children less than 6 months of age or older than 6 months for those with atypical or recurrent UTI. Your voiding cystoyurethrogram is the modality to evaluate for your vesicoureteral reflux. Your AAP guideline recommend doing it after the second febrile UTI or if an abnormality is seen in your renal bladder ultrasound. Now for the NICE criteria, again, it is age-dependent. No, for less than six months, if with recurrent UTI or atypical UTI. Um, if for six months to three years old, if with history of vesicoureteral reflux, for those with non E. coli UTI, for those children with poor urine flow and hydronephrosis. Um, but it is not recommended, it is not routinely recommended for, more, for children more than three years of age. 
<clears throat> How about the recommendation for your dimercaptosocyanic acid? So your DMSA um, can provide information about the extent of renal inflammation and renal scarring. Children with acute DMSA changes are at, at, at risk for VURs grade 3 to 5 on BCUG. However, both the NICE and the AAP guidelines do not recommend using your DMSA in routine evaluation of uh, children with first febrile UTI. So your AAP do not include the use of DMSA in their recommendation. Your NICE guidelines for febrile UTI, they only recommend DMSA four to six months after in patients with atypical or recurrent infection in children less than three years of age and those with recurrent infection in children more than three years of age. So how do we manage um, patients or pediatric patients with urinary tract infection? So the choice between oral and parenteral, parenteral therapy should be based on the age of the patient, the clinical suspicion of urosepsis, um, illness severity, refusal of fluids, food and oral medications if the patient has been vomiting, diarrhea, or if they're non-compliant and those with complicated UTI. But parenteral therapy is greatly favored over oral medications in newborn patients and infants aged less than two months. Because in this population, there is an increased risk of urosepsis and severe pyelonephritis. So how do we choose the antibiotic for this patient? Um, we base it on the local antimicrobial sensitivity patterns. And it should be adjusted according to the sensitivity testing of the isolated uropathogens. Um, the choice of antibiotics should be guided by good antibiotic stewardship. And it is very important that we know the local resistance pattern because it can vary between countries and more so even between hospitals. The duration of treatment is 7 to 14 days. So for the antibiotic, um, so not all available antibiotics are approved you know, by the national health authorities, especially in infancies. Um, so before the um, before the cultures are available, um, these are the choice of treatment for the patients. So for those patients needing IV medications, and if this patient has normal kidney function, tobramycin and gentamicin um, is started. However, for those children with abnormal kidney function, alternatives are your ceftriaxone and cefotaxin. Um, in children who can um, receive oral treatment without any known resistance to urinary culture, your cefixime or your amoxicillin clavulinic, um, can be used as an empiric treatment options. Um, uh, important to note also that we really have to treat your febrile UTI promptly because any delay in the treatment in children with febrile UTI for more than 48 to 72 hours increases the risk of renal scars. Okay, so these are the antibiotics um, and when we can use it and when, um, when uh, it is not recommended to use. So for neonates and young in infants, since um, these children has uh, um, more, say, uh, they, for neonates and young infants, they should be covered for um, enterococcus species. And since enterococcus is sensitive to ampicillin and first-generation cephalosporin, um, these are this antibiotics are added to this um, group population. Your nitrofurantoin should not be used for febrile UTI or pyelonephritis because of poor tissue penetration. Your nitrofurantoin is associated with increased risk of hemolytic anemia in infants less than six months of age 
and in patients with G6PD. Uretrimetoprim sulfamethoxazole is not for not recommended for less than six weeks of age, you no, know, because your sulfas, um, because of the liver prematurity, your sulfas will uh, may may increase your risk of current icterus in young infants by displacing the bilirubin from the plasma protein. Um, Fluorokin loans can, although although um, your 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 fluorokin loans cannot should not be your first line choice, um, and it can only be used in patients with suspected or proven resistant uropathogens such as your Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So how do we monitor UTI in patients? So with successful treatment, your urine usually become sterile after 24 hours. Leukocytoria normally disappears in three to four days and um, normalization of body temperature can be expected within 24 to 48 hours after the start of therapy. However, if you notice prolonged fever and failing recovery, then repeat ultrasound examinations is recommended in these cases. So for recurrent UTI, so recurrent UTIs are again problematic no? because symptoms are bothersome to children and recurrent febrile UTI will also result in renal scarring. Therefore, it is important to prevent the incidence of recurrent UTI. And um, chemoprophylaxis uh, is commonly used to prevent UTIs in children. No? However, we also have to weigh resistance versus benefit of giving chemoprophylaxis to the children. So who will benefit from chemoprophylaxis? Those are children with anatomic abnormalities of the urinary tract system, children with BBD and VUR, and the specific group of patients with incomplete bladder emptying, with proper, uh, properly performed clean intermittent catheterization, but still suffering from recurrent UTI. So in conclusion, we know that UTI in pediatric population is very common. In fact, it is the cause of, uh, it is responsible for 7% of febrile episodes in 20% uh, of children uh, being worked up for fever. Um, we have to get good history and physical examination, as well as knowing the different risk factors to aid in diagnosing children suspected of having urinary, urinary tract infection, and accurate diagnosis and prompt management of pediatric UTI is MS. Thank you.
Luis Antonio R. Balahadia, MD, DPBU, FPUA. He is a graduate doctor of medicine at the Devo Medical School Foundation in Devo City. He then had his general surgery training at the Devo Doctors Hospital and his general urology training at the Southern Philippines Medical Center. He had his fellowship in reconstructive urology, urethral stricture disease, at Saiful Anwar Hospital, Malang, Indonesia and he is currently having his hybrid fellowship in pediatric urology at Ohana One Surgical Aid Online at the University of Virginia and the University of Toronto. He is a fellow of the Philippine Urological Association and the Philippine Society of Genitourinary Reconstructive Surgeons. He is also a member of the International Society of Genitourinary Reconstructive Surgeons. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Luis Antonio Belahaja, and I would like to thank the PO Mindanao chapter for giving me the opportunity to share this lecture with you. So my lecture is entitled Penile Foreign Body, Boon or Vein. So penile foreign bodies are usually substances uh, injected by non-medical personnel into the penis. So they range from paraffin waxes, mineral oils, uh, Vaseline, that they would inject uh, to the penile corporal bodies. So uh, the reasons of which will be discussed later on why these people inject foreign bodies to the penis. So when did it all began? In 1899, an Austrian surgeon known as Robert Hersoni started using paraffin and Vaseline to uh, improve breast sizes. Later on, used these waxes for testicular prosthesis. However, these had disastrous results such as lipogranuloma formation and infection. So how do these foreign bodies react to the body? So basically, they are still foreign bodies and our immune system will fight these uh, foreign bodies, which results into granulomatous foreign body reaction, leading to inflammation, edema, scarring, deformity, and necrosis. At times, there will be migration of the material and invasion of the corpora cavernosa, which will result into regional lymphadenitis. So a study by Downey et al. in 2018 showed that the mean age was about 36.3 years old with a range of 17 to 71 years old. Symptoms develop usually after one to two years of the injection. So materials used usually are liquid paraffin, silicone, mineral oil, and baby oil. The clinical features of which are pain and swelling, penile deformity, painful erections, skin ulcer and fistula formation, erectile dysfunction, skin necrosis, inguinal lymph nodes, voiding dysfunction, paraphimosis and phenosis, other times sepsis, abscess or gangrene, and they have also noted a squamous cell carcinoma incidence, and of course the most common is penile deformity. So when asked why do these patients inject foreign bodies to their penis, the number one answer would be to enlarge the size of the penis. This is basically backed up by the view that if you have a big tool, it will entail a sign of masculinity and a sign of strength. That's why they inject these substances. Another one would be to treat erectile dysfunction. And the other one would be to satisfy the sexual partner. However, upon interviews, uh, this would be counterintuitive because their sexual partner will be dissatisfied with the result. So how do we diagnose these foreign bodies? Diagnosis is mostly clinical. We have to ask when did they inject and what did they inject 
to their opinions. It would be very obvious and as it will be shown later on. So other types modalities would be ultrasound and MRI. This would be used to further evaluate the blood flow or the skin viability of the things. So as we can see, this is one patient we have who had Vaseline injected in the pore, on the penis. So basically, it's, the penis is deformed and cannot be used for sexual interaction already. So we have here another patient who injected uh, paraffin by his friend, which resulted in necrosis, deformity, and infection of the skin. So how do we classify these foreign bodies? We classify them into four. First would be category one, showed in figure 9.1, which is a minimal lesion, less than one third of the penis, no suprapubic pain or scrotal involvement. Category two, in figure 9.2, would be a lesion in the shaft of the penis, more than one third of the penis, and still no suprapubic or scrotal involvement. Category three, as shown in figure 9.3, the lesion is in the shaft of the penis, already with suprapubic involvement, and half or less of the scrotal involvement. Category 4 would be, in figure 9.4, the deletion will be in the penis, suprapubic, and more than half of the scrotum. So we see all these kinds of classifications and categories uh, in our practice. So how do we treat these foreign bodies? If the lesions would only be small, we can do conservative treatments. Uh, Intralesional steroid injections can be used and hot water baths. However, for higher categories, there would be an aggressive treatment such as wide excision, skin flaps, grafts, and sometimes we would do staged procedures. So the principles of treatment of the excision of the paraphenoma would be the adequacy of the penile skin. If the penile skin is adequate, we can do excision and primary closure. However, if there is inadequate penile skin, that is when we have to evaluate the scrotal skin. Is the scrotal skin healthy or unhealthy? If the scrotal skin is healthy, we can do a scrotal skin flap. However, if the scrotal skin is unhealthy, we can do other kinds of skin grafts or do a staged procedure. So these are examples of the foreign bodies. So as you can see in the first picture, it is only category one. So we just remove the involved skin and the foreign body and did a primary closure. In contrast to this other picture, this was around category three to four. So after removal of all the foreign bodies, the plastic surgery did um, skin graft from the inguinal uh, skin. So what we do as uh, urologists, when we don't have to refer for uh, closure to plastic surgery, so this is what we do. We do the Cecil's two-stage procedure so as you can see in figure 6.1 and 6.2, there would be excision of the involved skin and all the penile foreign body. 
up to the level of the, in the scrotal junction. So we removed everything, scrotal skin, uh, the, we, removed, we removed everything, the penal skin, uh, up to the penoscrotal junction. After removing it, we would bury the penal shaft to the scrotum. For later on, we will use the skin for our penal shaft. So after that, we would put a drain and we would remove it after three to four days. So after six months of the initial procedure, as you can see, figure 7.1, that would be the result. We would have a penis buried into the scrotum, so after which we would pull up the penile shaft and do a DY plus T. So as you can see, the scrotum will be pulled down and we will repair the PL skin. After which we would put drains and will be removed around three to four days after. So in figure 7.6, that will be roughly be the result of our two-stage procedure. So the results of which uh, would be the following. The advantage of our results would be, it would be easy to perform and would not require special training for urologists. And the data layer will provide a slide because the data layer will provide So for our results, the advantage would be it would be easy to perform and would not need any special training for urologists. The Dartos layer will also provide a slide which will give so So for the results, the advantage of our procedure is that it would be easy to perform and would not require any special training for urologists. Another one would be the Tartus layer to provide a slide. So if you notice, but please don't do this right now, you have to pinch your inner skin so there will be sliding of the skin. If you use a skin graft, it will stick into the corporal body and will not be the same as the scrotal skin, which is a darkest layer. However, the disadvantage of our procedure it is that it will entail two stages. This would provide um, financial and uh, psychological barriers for our patients, especially in, during these times. And it would also result in a uh, hairy penis. Now we call this a relative disadvantage because uh, other uh, patients would prefer uh, hairy penis and would uh, look at it as a special thing. So to conclude, female foreign bodies are injection. So to conclude, female foreign body injection are mostly performed by non-medical persons and the community must be informed of the disfiguring effects to the genitals. So my takeaway would be, be happy, be content with what you have. Uh, 
that would be my last slide. So thank you again, POA Mindanao Chapter, for giving me the opportunity. And good day to you all. Thank you.
Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. In behalf of the PUA Mindanao chapters, officers and members, I would like to formally close this third online 17 PUA Mindanao chapter postgraduate course. In this past several hours, it has been a very informative and educational learning experience for all of us. I am sure by this time you are already able to identify urology patient symptoms and more importantly, which of these patients would need a referral to a urologist. I, do, I would like to thank first and foremost all our distinguished speakers for sharing their valuable time knowledge, and expertise. Secondly, I would like to thank the organizing committee headed by Dr. Nimrod Firasa, whose tireless effort made this event a reality. Thank you also to all the PUA Mindanao chapter officers and members for all of their contribution. Thirdly, thank you to our valued partner and sponsor, ECE Pharmaceutical Corporation, for their unending support and without whom this event would not be possible. Lastly, thank you to all the participants whose interest in urology motivates and encourages us to pursue and improve on this PUA Mindanao Chapter annual event. So once again, thank you to everyone. Have a good day and good afternoon.